Oregon Ocean Science Trust regular meeting, August 3rd, 2016. I do like it. Yeah. Very easy. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, I didn't notice it was 10 hours in front. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. I parked the jail a lot and walked down the road. I just parked right here. Oh, with that. Yeah, with a new 10 hour parking. It's horrible for staff who like to get two hour shuttle, right? but yes. for visiting yeah. staff people, yeah. it's much better. And we only have to pay for <laughs> She's the one stressed. What is it an hour to park at? What do we know? Yeah, well, I paid six dollars to pay through four thirty. I got yeah, I think that makes six bucks all day. Dollar fifteen hour. She's a pro. Okay. Well, so it's the same thing as parking the yellow lot for half a day down here, huh? Right here. Unless more put in all day. You put in all day? No, just four hours. I just put in until 4 30. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, on the street, both streets, front and back. You can now park right here. Oh, okay. Up to 10 hours. Only quarters? No, 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 no quarters. It's the, it's it's the same thing as you have at the yellow lot, right? It's parking the shade. Yes. We are happy to Chris. Hey, how you doing? Yeah, how are your flights? Oh, uh, well, better than <laughs> <laughs> expected. Yeah, that's good. Uh, that's that's good. No, no, no. That was great. Yeah. Nice. And that's yeah, nice. I was just so worried because I was supposed to work. Oh, good. That's great to know. Well, so you must have the same yeah. one I do because that's the same noise yeah. mine makes. And it is. It's the same song as seven. It's going to work from the Midwest. The gold with a clear case. Yeah. Did they sell it to everywhere? Yeah, no, it's much more stressful. It's much more stressful. It's much more stressful. It's much more stressful. Yes, me too. So you're taking care of the sun this year? Yes. Sorry. Thank you. Well, you're busy. It's all during the day. Yeah, I'm going to take an hour call back while I'm there. I'm going to take an hour call back while I'm there. Well, it's good to see you. Yeah, it's really nice to see you. Um... One of the things we made a couple of things. Yes, I mean, uh, we connected. Fine. But we did an exhibit on Joel. Are you vacationing? Are you vacationing? Yeah. Yeah. We're going to get going because I want to. Okay. Well, they have to schedule it. Okay. Maybe in wherever it seems appropriate. Okay. All right. Did you have a Oh, yeah, you definitely have one. Oh, yeah, but then I lost Christina also, so. <laughs> She's went to the bathroom. All right. <laughs> Louise, we have coffee and cookies. I think there's probably plenty for our massive audience we have today. The massive audience. <laughs> Help yourself. Coffee and cookies. I appreciate all the extra space that we have today. It's very freeing. Good. I drank my first cup of coffee in 13 years last week. <laughs> so wow. I what this has to Dinner in the wagon? Why? Well, uh, <laughs> so I was going through chemo and couldn't oh, tolerate okay. the acid from um, caffeine. So I, once I was off it, I didn't get you back on it. You've been the director of this agency for all those years? I've never had a cup of coffee wow. the entire time I was working here. <laughs> or in the governor's office for the second time. So it's just... Good for you. But, You're like my wife. She doesn't drink coffee either. But I've been enjoying the smell of it, and I thought, okay, I'm going to try this again. And the first day, I made it way too strong. I was like, whoa. Good, do you remember? Yeah. <laughs> and now I'm sort of into a weak cup of coffee once in the morning, and that's it. Gabriella today? Yes. Uh, I talked to her or emailed her sometime earlier this week and she said she'd see me, so Great. I'm thinking she's coming. For her final meeting. Mm-hmm. Is the coffee strong? <laughs> no, it's just the Gabriella yeah. leaving for <laughs> loss. <laughs> Does anyone know where Casino landed, or if she landed somewhere, Casino Lee? 
she did not know where, where she was going okay. when I talked to her last. Yeah. So. And uh, Gabriella's assistant left, and Nancy Salber, I don't even know who's over there right now. The governor's office, yeah. they're all leaving. Richard and Lori. They're all going out to agencies where there's more security. <laughs> Richard is leaving, or no, Richard's, Richard's still there? there. Richard's so still they, there. Yeah, there's still Richard, Lori on it, and Brett Brown's going Brett's still there? Yeah. But I don't think, unless they hired someone last week, they didn't have an administrative assistant as of two weeks ago. Oh, how's Richard going to function? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm going to call the meeting to order uh, since we've got uh, four of the voting members here. And I don't think Emily's on the phone. Yeah, so we're we'll waiting for her to call in. Um, so I want to welcome everybody, and uh, let's just do a quick round of introductions. Louise Salvade, Executive Director of the Ocean Science Trust. Laura Anderson, a voting member from Newport. Jim Sumich, uh, Trust Member. Christina Molnikowski, Trust Member. Here. Emily Knight, I'm Program Director of Ocean Science Trust. And um, Skyly McAfee and I'm with the Nature Conservancy and the uh, North America Oceans Program. Great. Back here. Is there something behind me? Or? Yeah, but go ahead. Yeah, oh, uh, Randy Smith from Portland State University. Great. Over here. Uh, Sarah Polizar, Oregon Sea Grant. Great. Welcome. John Sarah from Congressman Trader's Office. Welcome. Stephen Carter, the Nature Conservancy. Great. Hi, Gabriella Bolfar, Governor Brown's office. Great. Uh, so in terms of opening comments, I just want to report on uh, the OPEC meeting that I attended. Uh, I provided the memo that you all saw to OPEC uh, at that meeting, uh, asked them to take a look at the questions. Uh, we had a good discussion. There were some questions about things that they didn't see in the Science Summit uh, report or see enough of, uh, particularly related to water quality and marine debris were the two that came up uh, significantly. And so I tried to respond to questions about that. Uh, I told, asked OPAC to review the questions, the priority questions that we had come up with and get any feedback to us by uh, July 15th. We received no feedback. We also posted it on the website and asked for public comment and uh, got none. So either everybody's asleep or we did a brilliant job of creating those questions and everybody's happy, but uh, we'll test that theory again when we go out for rulemaking and those questions are identified as the things that we're gonna seek proposals on or uh, uh, seek grant applications on. So. Uh, uh, so a good discussion with OPAC, uh, talk also a little bit with them about uh, the potential for using STAC uh, to help us, and um, I think there was agreement that STAC is now open to helping whatever organizations need them, given whatever time uh, constraints that they've got, and so um, they certainly are available to us, and several STAC members were at the Science Summit, so there's a lot of overlap between uh, the scientists that OPAC uh, uses and uh, the science folks that we had in the room for the science summit. Gabrielle. I just want to clarify two things. The Scientific and Technical Advisory Committee, um, for some folks who might, who might not know, because um, you were saying stack. Yeah, so sorry. Just, yes. just clarifying. Thank and you. The other, I got texts from Emily uh, Martin, who was trying to call in, and there was a problem with the code. I think we've got, hopefully we've so, got it fixed. Has she beeped in? Nope, not okay, yet. Okay, let's give it a minute. I just texted her and... Oh, uh, there we go. Emily? Yes, that worked. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, Emily. Hi, Emily. Do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm Emily Goodwin Martin. I live in Hood River, Oregon, and it's a pleasure to serve on the Oregon Science Trust Board. I run an outdoor science school called Cascade Mountain School. It's a nonprofit here in the Hood River, Oregon, and Trout Lake, Washington area. And I have two beautiful boys that I love very dearly. <laughs> what else do you want me to say? That's, a, that's good, Emily. Thanks. <laughs> so I just uh, gave a report on the OPEC meeting. And the other thing I want to do is uh, in front of you, and Emily, this was emailed to you, you've got a spreadsheet of the work that Casina started and Jim has picked up on the existing research that's going on in Oregon's near shore. And so give Jim a couple minutes here to talk about progress on that. Sure. Casina uh, assisted quite a bit on this. Basically, we started with the uh, 
near shore research inventory that was published in 2011, I think, uh, and and work from that as a starting point, and then we we've, we've extended out quite a bit. Um, if you have a copy of the spreadsheet in front of you, there are still uh, people that I'm hoping to hear from. The responses are dribbling in or not pouring in, um, but uh, as recently as yesterday, I got another one. So there are about four more lines that need to be added that we've already received information from uh, relative to this version of, of the spreadsheet. But I think we're getting a pretty good overall idea of what is going on. And, and I think that this is going to have to remain a very dynamic, active, uh, active kind of uh, spreadsheet because many of the projects that have been reported are master's, PhD student uh, research projects that last two or three or four or five years, uh, depending on funding, depending on their grades, depending on all sorts of things. And so some of these are going to drop out probably in the next year or two, and others will be added. And, it'll be a bit of a chore to try to keep up with that because some of them are so quiet in terms of their visibility out there. Great, thanks Jim. Uh, so what I'll, the only comment I'll make on this is I was um, somewhat expecting but also surprised by how short the list is. <laughs> it just speaks to how much we need to expand on research and monitoring and I'm sure. Just a quick question. Jim, was there any significance to the highlighting of certain rows? I wasn't sure oh. if that indicated anything. Uh, yes, there's a code, color code down at the bottom. Oh, it is? Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. So we're still waiting yeah. to hear from the, the, uh, the, the, the appointments. Can I add a, a, just a, a point of fact, if you will? I was actually at a meeting earlier this week with Jack Barth at Oregon State University, and he commented on the fact that out of the entire building at, at CEOS, the College of Earth, <laughs> Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences. Um, coast. Yes, Coast. Uh, yeah, <laughs> well, however it is. Um, there, there are really only a handful of researchers that are working in Oregon waters. Right. That, right. You know, so, and that's at least from, from OSU's perspective. So, but there's a lot of other people from yeah. other institutions. And that's true of Fisheries and Wildlife Department, too. That okay. Many of them have projects in other countries, other continents, okay. other oceans, if they're marine even. Yeah. And, and his point was the Marine Studies Initiative um, right. will have an, an impact on that and, and, um, and certainly the Ocean Science Trust partnering on that because the Marine Studies Initiative will also be partnering beyond OSU to you know, many other uh, ocean institutions that have an interest in Oregon's offshore. So, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, any other opening comments? Louise, can um I'm trying to track down that document. Was it just sent recently, or what? who was it sent from in the last sent few weeks? Sent from me, and it was sent Monday, I think. I sent it to everybody. Okay. okay. Thank you. I'll some find it. So the numbers are from the Nearshore Research Inventory that they did. Uh, so okay. that's, that's what those are. Thank you. Yep. Uh, so next up is approval of the June 8th meeting summary. Are there any edits? I have one, Chris, uh, on the top of the second page. I didn't catch this when you sent it to me earlier. The word management should be monitoring in the title there. And I carried over the same mistake into the OPAC memo, but... <laughs> <laughs> I need to get management out of my vocabulary and monitoring in it into it. <laughs> Anybody else have any edits? Is there a motion to approve? So move. Second. 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 Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay, the motion carries. The meeting summary is approved with the one edit. Uh, Sabrina, are you doing this tra training for us, or is Chris? You don't want me to do it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I had a feeling. <laughs> we're not going to do a big training, but I just wanted to clarify for you guys that um, we're trying to, we know, we first time ever, we well, first time in many, many years, apparently, that we've had a travel coordinator, and so we've gone back and gone through some of the, uh, the policies and came to the determination that we need to make sure that you guys are submitting your travel reimbursements. 
They would pre the agency would prefer that we do them on a monthly basis uh, as much as we possibly can. Um, and that you guys need to remember that you need to be doing a $30 a day per diem rate. And I know some people uh, submitted their travel reimbursements without that in it, so we need to make sure that you guys do do that because you do get that. And um, that's your quote unquote salary. Exactly, your that's your salary that's for each of your trips, that's <laughs> your, your payment. So uh, just be sure to do that. And then I do have a private car authorization because you are uh, technically representing the state when you are attending these meetings. So we do have to have a private car authorization form on file for you. So um, I have one completed for you, and the department is only allowed or is only accepting them to be done on a yearly basis, so we can only do them for one year at a time. So we'll have to do them again in January, but I have those for each of you to sign today before you go as well. Okay. And I think I've gotten everybody's travel in, and um, Christina, I've got yours for you to sign, and then we'll get it submitted. We'll move forward from there. So did anybody have any questions about... Oh. We don't, the no, legislators do not, right? Because we, we knew we did it, but I, I just wanted to make sure that no. on the record that just we Just the voting are, board yeah. members, yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Did anybody else have any questions about any of the dialogue we were having? So, or? Sabrina, I had a question about something in okay. your email, and I actually went and back and looked at the, the statutes of the task policy. Uh -huh. So, you seem to imply in your email that we had to have receipts for meals if we were going to get covered for them. As I read the DAS policy, it says with board and commission members, you have the option of taking the per diem rate or right. submitting a receipt. So right. is that correct? We yes, so either it's one, one or the other. Yeah. But if you want to claim your meals, you do need to have a receipt for that. Right. It's not the same as it is for actual state employees. It's a little bit different for trust members and board members. So it's one or the other, but if you want to, you know, use your receipts and get reimbursed with that and keep your receipts and submit those in lieu of the 30 days per per diem rate, then you are welcome to do one or the other. Yes. Okay, so that's still not my understanding of how the policies work, so I just, uh, and maybe we need to talk about this offline and get it sorted out. But my understanding is the $30 is not the per diem, it's the compensation board and commission right. members right. get. There is right. a separate per diem for lodging and meals based on the state policy. So you have so much for staying in a hotel, so much for right. each meal based on how long you're traveling and when you start and end your travel. Right. So you get the $30 and then you get mileage and parking reimbursement. And then on top of that, if you're traveling before, I think it's six o'clock in the morning and after seven right. o'clock at night on the day of our meetings, right. then you would be entitled to 25% of the meal per diem or you could submit a receipt for the actual expenditure for your meal. Right, I can clarify that that is that is not my understanding. Okay, well that's, that's not my the way it was explained to me by the travel coordinator, so. Okay, so. Um, I'll get clarification great. on that and make sure that we're on the same page, because she actually was reading through the DAS policy and reading through everything at the same time, and I said, just tell me what we need to know. Yeah, so there are two different so, sections to the DAS policy. Yeah, One exactly. talks about board yeah. and commission members mm -hmm. being able to either submit receipts or take the, the per diem amount. Yeah. And then there's one later on that says you need to submit receipts for your meals. Right. But I think that that's with the caveat that that's only if you're seeking actual reimbursement as opposed to... Well, and to then we also out. have the legislative, you know, guidelines that were written up for this committee as well, which right. have a little bit of different verbiage in them even yet, so... Right. <laughs> okay. Yep. So... So and I, think, I don't think meals is an issue at this point, right. and yeah. uh, hopefully won't be going forward unless yeah. we have really long. Because the, the only one that would have been issued for was for the science summit, summit. Mm -hmm. and our meals, meals were provided were for the most part. So. For the most part, yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay, yeah. great. And one more question about parking. So if we park mm -hmm. in parking meters, we can't get a receipt. So correct, we don't get any reimbursement. For you that. can get reimbursed for that. You just need. What, what the department would like is receipts when and where possible and able to obtain them. Because a lot of times it spits you out a ticket, or a lot of them, you know, you get the little, like if you park a meal a lot, you get the little stuff you put on your dash. They expect you to turn those in, but obviously with meters you don't have that. So and so, Christine, if you haven't noticed, there are no meters anymore out yeah. here. I just parked across the street. So there, 
They're like pay station boxes. They're now pay stations, so you get a receipt to put yeah. on your dashboard. And the same thing behind us, 10-hour parking, 10-hour yeah. parking, so you don't need to go to the yellow lot or where, I don't know where you park. But I just, just park right across the street. Um, and there's still meters, still metal. There's metal meters. meters. Yeah, so right up front river, and right the behind the here, no longer meters. So they, on the other side of the street from where you parked, they now have switched to the modern building. Yeah, yeah. so it's just it. pay yeah. stations. So those okay. you will get a little receipt stuff yeah. that comes out. Okay. Yeah. Okay, anything else on travel reimbursement? So, Sabrina, you've got what you need from everybody. Yes, I just need to sign something. Because if I pay for the sale, I'll give you my receipt. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Same number of hours. I just need to have you guys sign your private car authorizations right. before you leave today. Okay. So we can get those on file. And you want these on a monthly basis from now on, right? Well, after each know? meeting. After yes, each after each meeting, yeah. yes. Yeah. 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 Not six months later. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, fiscal got on me a little bit. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But we got it squared away. <laughs> Great. Okay. Uh, so I want to uh, thank Skyly McAfee and Emily Knight. Uh, who uh, uh, Skyly is the former executive director of the California Science Trust, and Emily is the current senior po program manager. And uh, Skyly now works for TNC, still on coastal and ocean issues. Um, but she was around when the Co California News got started and so has uh, graciously agreed to come share uh, her knowledge uh, about uh, the startup phase of their organization and a little bit about how they operate and I think someone is going to assist uh, as a current employee. So with that, we'd invite you up to the table and... Yes. We appreciate it. Yes. <laughs> and I might mention that the two of these are traveling on their own dime or their organization's dime. So. No, we have receipts to turn in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As I explained to both of them, we have no budget, and so. <laughs> so thank you. Of course. Yes. Uh, yes. I, there, we have a small presentation for you, but while we're getting that hooked up, um, foremost, thank you very much for inviting me, and congratulations. And um, I'm really, really excited about this effort. Um, by way of correction, I wasn't there at the inception of the at the very beginning. I'm actually the th I was the third executive director, but I was with the Ocean Science Trust in California for six years um, since uh, the very beginning of 2010, um, and and sort of recently. Um, Gina and, and her ilk dragged me away to join the Nature Conservancy, and um, I'm, I'm grateful for it, but I miss the Ocean Science Trust, and the Ocean Science Trust now is in the incredibly capable hands of Tom Maloney. Um, I don't know if you've heard of him or met him, but he's a former Nature Conservancy person as well, so we just kind of went <laughs> and we looked at each other and we're like, what, what just happened? So, um, and where are they based in uh, California? In Oakland. In Oakland. Yep, downtown Oakland. <laughs> Where are you now? Here? Um, I am also, uh, I'm on the Sonoma Coast uh, oh, in California. Darn. Yeah. <laughs> it's cold there this time of year, though. It's terrible. <laughs> but um, uh, my understanding of the early days of uh, the California Ocean Science Trust is that sort of the provenance of the idea came, I think, from the same place as this one, which is the U.S. Uh, you know, Commission's report on oceans and the Pew report that sort of reflected on... The, the deep necessity to, to bring science to the policy table and to enhance that capacity. And um, in California, there was sort of a spate of really um, aspirational and progressive legislation that included the Marine um, Life, uh, excuse me, the uh, Marine Life Management Act, which was this you know huge scoping piece of legislation that directed uh, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to make sure that. They consider ecosystems that all of the fisheries are within fisheries management plans and just, you know, really forward looking for 1999. And then there's a piece of legislation called CORSA, which is the California Ocean Resources Stewardship Act, which came out also in 1999, which was the founding legislation for the California Ocean Science Trust. And it was written, both of those acts, in fact, were written by Fred Keeley, uh, who was in the legislature at the time, and he was on our board. And I pinged on him quite often to help me understand what your intent exactly was. And he gave me some very helpful and some very confusing guidance throughout my tenure at OST. And largely it said, we envisioned an organization 
that was neither fish nor fowl, and both fish and fowl go. <laughs> um, and by that he meant, you know, we are dedicated to this not being a government agency. We want independent science, um, except for, for when it's expedient to be brought within a government <laughs> agency. So I kind of was always very slippery on how we managed that. Um, it created um, some very novel problems for us. How do we directly take government funds in service of government priorities? while simultaneously taking philanthropic funds and, and federal funds and so forth, because it was seen that we would be a clearinghouse that actually uh, served a variety of roles, but convener roles and some funding roles, but also leveraged state investment. You know, let's take those state dollars and then tease a little bit more out of philanthropy and, and get the federal partners at the table and augment what we had to play with. The, the structure for that is very difficult. So in 2005, another really important piece of legislation was the California Ocean Protection Act, or COPA, created the California Ocean Protection Council. And that's a structure that um, is, is a little bit unique in that it's, um, it's a council of our two secretaries, EPA and Resources, as well as <coughs> alternating with the um, Director of State Lands, who in this case is Gavin Newsom um, in his lieutenant governor role. There are legislative folks and then there are public folks. And this was um, uh, an entity that was specifically envisioned to sort of provide that overarching guidance and policy vision that is science informed on behalf of the sorts of challenges that California is going to see. Um, that wasn't in just in service of a single agency. So the idea of putting resources next to EPA, putting the legislative there, putting state lands at the table, what science and what legislation can we do to bring, break down some of those silos. So California Ocean Science Trust predated the Ocean Protection Council, but and, and it kind of, Ocean Science Trust bumped along the bottom a little bit. There was a 50% ED for a long time, and. And you know, not all, and they were you know with the board. Gosh, I saw some of those early documents, and Leon Panetta's on there, and all these fabulous people are on there, and people had a lot of really important uh, visions and aspirations for it. But they didn't really have funding, and they didn't really have a problem, and they didn't really know how to get it going. Um, and it took my predecessor, Amber Mace, um, and a couple of other key opportunities, not the least of which is marine protected areas and things like this, where. Um, a lot of people saw that this sort of quasi-agency, quasi-independent organization was just what we needed to knit some important communities together on behalf of multiple agencies. So um, I'm a little bit rambling because I'm hoping this thing picks up. But the uh, <laughs> yes. and then I don't have any kids, but uh, <laughs> if I did, I'd love them. Tell and then oh. <laughs> and I have a new puppy. <laughs> You hear about the puppy, but I always mention my dog, but I refrain. <laughs> <laughs> you might I just want to explain for some folks who don't know, Cali so uh, California has two umbrella um, cabinet level agencies under which natural resource agencies are departments are organized. So Cali PA has all the pollution related ones, if you will, water quality, air quality, things like that. And the resources agency, uh, I think the natural resources agency now they call it, is um, has you know, Department of Fish and, and Wildlife now you call it, and, and um, you know, water resources and things like that. So just to... And, and I think that's a really here. important clarifying point, Gabriella. And you know, if you if you go to Sacramento, there's a really tall and beautiful building, and that's the Cal EPA. And then there's another tall building, and that's resources. And then there's another tall building, and that's um, finance. Mm -hmm. And you know, and they're all in different places. And you know, these the Ocean Protection Council and the Ocean Science Trust, which became sort of a sister organization, were one of the consolidating efforts to pull those things together and inflict the chore of, of envisioning what it is we needed to go forward. In fact, written into our legislation for the Ocean Science Trust was the composition of our board, and it included members of each of those buildings. <laughs> it included resources, EPA, and finance as standing members that were appointed by, this, uh, appointed by legislation. And then, I, I just love this, then the Secretary of uh, Resources in California was charged with having to work with the two university systems, the University of California and, um, 
and California state system to identify two other board members. So this, we, you know, we began to think of was the embodiment of cross-jurisdictional policymakers and academic science at the same table. And to kind of pull that together, it became a, a, actually a really sort of a progressive place to have some conversations about where should we be and who do we need to bring into Sacramento and how do we mobilize and incentivize the academic community on behalf of those things. Um, boom. All right. He's, he's in a run. Oh, thank you so much. So thank you for the preamble. Uh, it might be there. Uh, we... Um, no worries. So one of the... Um, oh, oops. It's funny how they... There we go. There we go. Slideshow. Oh, it's worth it, everybody. It's at the top there. Slideshow. So this was a little bit about we, we wanted this to look like a molecule because we were science geeks at the time, but we we um, <laughs> we got over we, that. we sort of and and, and we actually moved beyond putting the Ocean Science Trust at the center of the universe since we, we developed this, but we actually sort of imagined um, that the COPA that formed the Ocean Protection Council and the Corsa legislation was our key ingress into, uh, into the legislature writ large, and that we've worked most closely with the California Ocean Protection Council. Next slide. Um, as well as, and this is, I think, a really important piece. Next one. Um, the Ocean Protection Council's uh, legislatively mandated science advisory team. So they had, the, it was called for that they were obligated to convene uh, um, an advisory body of you know, knowledgeable academic scientists. That was turned over to the Ocean Science Trust to be the conveners of, and that was a very um, deliberate structure that I, I am grateful that California did at the time, which is to say, we need independent science, we need science that's out from under government generation or any government bias or influence, to bring to bear on our policy decisions. And since the Ocean Science Trust it has a, a, you know, one big foot outside of government, it convenes this uh, on behalf of the best possible outcome. So the structure of calling this independent science was really critical. And we were paid for with uh, grant money to be the conveners of the science tr uh, science advisory team on behalf of all of the Ocean Protection Council's funding decisions. And that is, um, to be clear, the science advisory team were not the only scientists we talked to. We considered them the window to help us understand and frame issues and then who we should be talking to in terms of what those buckets of expertise are. You know, if we're thinking about bilge water, if we're thinking about how to dismantle or decommission our offshore oil rig. We're thinking about this, what kinds of, of science expertise, and then through sort of an egalitarian process, land on the best scientists. So we really were stewards of the process to ensure that this was as unbiased and as robust as possible in service of, of state needs. And we spent a lot of time sort of really geeking out on process. Um, but um, so that, you know, at the same time, uh, we worked very, very closely with NGOs, um, learned over the years to work much more closely with the fishing community, the academic community, as well as tribal communities uh, and, and tribes to help um, understand how to bring them at the ta to the table, what their knowledge systems were, what their interests were. Very clear that we cannot be supporting the state or framing priorities of the state around something like a fisheries management or a marine protected area without those who are going to be impacted by those decisions to be at the table, as well as informing those decisions, not just sitting there, we check, oh, we had a fisherman check, but really help us understand these impacts, uh, help us understand how to make this better. And structuring those conversations was a big piece of what the California Ocean Science Trust did. So, um, you know, part of our conversations as we, as we we're um, trying to be simultaneously useful, but also um, introspective was to consider what the, uh, 
the role was of science in policy. And there is a huge, really deep and exciting scholarship on this issue. Um, there's a huge, exciting scholarship on what a boundary organization is and what the use of it is and, and the different forms it can take and how it needs to be structured and the things you need to look at. And we thought a lot about how do we set ourselves up as an example boundary organization. Um, and part of what we would spend some time on is, you know, we would go to our science advisory team and say, in the early days, what should we be working on? And that was a lively conversation because you can you bet that the people who studied phytoplankton were like, it's about HABs, it's about primary productivity, it's about this, it's about this. And we talked to our people who study, you know, physiology of fishes, and they had a little bit of a different opinion and had a lot to do with physiology of fishes. And then we go over here, and um, and we were end up sort of thinking, well, we need to have the flip side of the conversation. What what's needed? Next slide. So, you know. I've shown this, this cartoon before, and, and we think about the panel of experts and what's relevant and what's useful, and we think of that panel sitting there saying, well, I bet this man is experiencing tachycardia, and the other one's, well, his, certainly his kidneys are in, in renal failure, and I bet that he's this and this, all exactly perfectly relevant. But how do they sort of talk amongst themselves and say, somebody's got to get him a drink of water? <laughs> this, what everybody said is absolutely correct. But at some point, what are we going to do about the fact that, you know, how, how did he get here? How do we prevent this from happening again? And by the way, he needs to get to the hospital. So to, to really sort of shape the relevance versus the utility of, of science at the decision table, which again is regulatory management and policy, uh, became something that we, we became students of and published papers on. It was interesting. Thank you. Next slide. And uh, another one. Thank you. So we have California's environmental policy leadership. This is legislation. This is the agency system. These are the commissions. This We've got, you know, the Coastal Commission. We've got State Lands Commission. We've got um, other councils like the Strategic Growth Council, the Ocean Protection Council. Uh, we've got all of these things happening and we wanted to be as useful as possible if we were going to take any of these state dollars. Next slide. Um, and next one, what are those science needs? And at the same time, uh, you know, a parallel arrow is, and next, next one, is what is being developed in the academic community. So how are we growing our knowledge? What does that knowledge look like? What do you do with new data? How do you advance theory and application research trajectories? What's the funding landscape for those things? And we saw ourselves sort of in the middle of those two parallel conversations and, and the next slide, and needing to do the best we could to shape both of them and to link both of them. And um, that put us, uh, for, for a couple of years, um, in probably the worst possible position in the world because everyone was just a little bit bummed with us, which after a while we said, I think we're, I think we're getting it right because they're all equally bummed. <laughs> you know, um, but, but sort of to get a really deep understanding of the drivers of academic science and knowledge generation. It's not just data and it's not just research, but rather it's knowledge and then how to make that knowledge as useful as possible. And simultaneously deeply understanding um, w how science is used in decisions was, was something that we undertook kind of aggressively in the early days, I would say. And we even had funding for that kind of work. It was like our own research. It was, it was, it was sociology. Who knew? But, um, and next slide. And next. And let's just go through a couple of those. So we thought about, um, here we have been entrusted to be the state's chosen partner um, for not just communicating science or identifying it, but, but truly integrating it into decisions as well as teasing up um, interest from the agency side to take independent science, and that's a different conversation. What is the constructive role? Science is not the only thing we're basing our decisions on. Um, absolutely not the only thing, but generally good science at the table will support better decisions. Um, and then the Ocean Science Trust staff started off being a bunch of scientists and, excuse me, a bunch of natural scientists and ecology, the ecologists. And we ended up sort of adding um, a few um, natural scientists and anthropologists, uh, students of the science to policy <coughs> continuum. Uh, we had Ryan Meyer, who had a, a Fulbright scholarship in thinking about this, um, as well as people in technology and communications. And for every issue that we engaged, we would 
have that sort of a suite of expertise around the, every single one of those issues. And so the, you know, the things we're working on will probably be very, very familiar to you all up here, MPA monitoring, certification, fisheries management, so on and so forth. Uh, climate is a big one and, and growing up. Um, some issues would pop up, desal for a while, and then, um, then it was like, no, don't worry on that because we just, the water issue is just too darn scary, go away. And we were like, <laughs> happily. <laughs> um, you know, there was um, the platform decommissioning was a big one for a while. And we saw ourselves sort of building a toolbox of capacity to, to sort of serve in that linking role. Um, and one of them was we became, uh, well, what we, what we called ourselves experts at thinking about how to provide really robust um, technical review. So if there's a funding decision on behalf of the state, how do we know that the science is the best science, you know? Um, how, how do we sort of take delivery of what has been funded and make sure that they delivered on it? And that requires you know, sending it out for review, so we built that into the state's funding decisions. Um, we thought a lot about and wrote a lot about expert solicitation and expert judgment because we're not often talking about novel resource, research. We're talking about putting the right people in the room and saying, do you think this kelp forest is healthier now than it was five years ago? You know, that's, that's and w I, many, many conversations started with, you can't ask us that. There's no way. We need 30 more years to figure this out. And we sort of would say, if we're not asking you, the state's 10, top 10 kelp forest ecologists, and you can't do this, then fine. Thank you very much. You're dismissed. We'll go down on the streets of downtown Oakland and Broadway and ask the first 10 people. And they're like, no, 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 that's us, that's us, that's us. Okay, yeah, then right. It's you. Nobody gets it better than you, but it's not about data. It's about building a process to get the best synthetic thinking on an issue that might be, yeah, it's better, it's better. That might be the answer. And it's hard for scientists to get to a place where something like that is what, what you need. On a scale of eight to 10, you know, a zero to 10, what is it? It used to be a six, now it's an eight. That's helpful. You know, that's what we needed. That's not funding a research project, necessarily. Um, it's, it's, it's buying some lunches and some beers. Um, <laughs> that's a budget again. There we go. There go the receipts. No alcohol. Boom. Um, next slide. Thank you. And we, again, we spent a great deal of time very quickly in, in really diving into a science needs assessment that we undertook formally. So we would go to the Department of Fish and Wildlife and work with the people on the ground and interview them, from a, do a sociological study, and say, when do you use science? What holds you up? What is most valuable? Whose do you go to? How do you know it's the right thing? But we'd have that same conversation at the very top of that ladder and get very different answers, which was fascinating. And then we would do it in all these different you know, marine resource management places. And we sort of built and, and populated a, a, a vast database that sort of helped us understand the issues and the challenges, and also when and how and where and in what forms um, uh, you know, scientific knowledge would be most useful. So, they, you know, some people would literally say, every five years I'm obligated to upload this plan, uh, the, update this plan. So what's that cycle look like? What does uploading it look like? How do you get, and, or others would be like, I have to make decisions just this fast. You know, what do we do about orcas at SeaWorld? <laughs> you know, there's no time to, to think about that. So how do you sort of plan for those things, or how do you address those kinds of things on the fly? Um, and to have a knowledge of all of those different grain sizes and timelines created a, a sort of our knowledge of, of what the literature calls linking and syncing science to decision making, which um, took a lot of different forms. Um, uh, so this just talks about that in the interest of time, we'll keep moving. Uh, likewise, you know, we had to understand um, more than a single agency, more than a couple of agencies, so we worked more broadly across the spectrum. Thank you. Uh, the thing that really breathed life into us was our um, very difficult conversation in designating the marine protected areas in, in, along the coast of California. Um, it landed um, a network that the state has invested heavily in. Um, but what it is we undertake in monitoring that 
um, was fell to us to figure out, and it wasn't us being scientists and sitting there saying, well, this is what you should be monitoring, but rather as the convener of fishermen, as the convener of tribes, as the convener of stakeholders, and as the convener of scientists to say what are, our, what are the legislative goals and what are the broader opportunities that the protected areas are going to afford? How do we use them to think about climate change? Um, and honestly, in that conversation, we were sort of able to say, you know, the fishermen were pretty cheesed with the state for kicking them out of their historic fishing grounds to put these marine protected areas in, and what have they done about water quality? And fishermen are like, you know, how come it's always us? And so we got busy and said, well, let's address water quality. Let's use them as a, as a political experiment, natural resource, to begin to identify the, the areas where we need to decompress um, uh, polluted runoff or neutral, nutrient runoff on behalf of the fishermen because they had a very, very, very good point and they needed us to follow up. And, you know, so we, we pulled those in. That was not a question of the legislation, but we saw a broader opportunity, particularly in the face of climate change, how do you decompress multiple stressors instead of just the easiest one to do, which is, okay, fishermen, you have new lines to consider. But frankly, no, we need to think about discharge. We need to think about non-point source and point source discharge. We need to think about land use practices, marine debris, invasive species, all the other things that we know are slamming on. Um, so it was our role about thinking about how do you know we build very robust and durable partnerships around the marine protected area monitoring that brought everybody from citizen scientists in, um, new students, new funding, let's incentivize California Sea Grant, let's incentivize master students and PhD students, let's incentivize uh, uh, recreational and state fishermen to help with this, what are the goals of our tribal communities, let's build a monitoring plan and let's kind of cobble together how that gets done because we're, the state is not going to write a check every year to say, okay scientists go do this. Um, another piece of what we do is um, we're trying to build the same sort of reflective philosophy online. So if you ever have time to look at oceanspaces.org, it's sort of a place to host the actual data, demonstrate where those data came from, and participate in the conversation around those data. So um, that, that's kind of who we are, where we've come from. Happy to answer any questions. And um, also, I think Emily wants to talk about the OAH panel, which is the panel that Oregon um, participated in I think to great success along with Washington and, and British Columbia. Um, so I think you know everybody uh, relatively familiar with the uh, the West Coast panel. They came out with their final products just this last April, and so they were convened for three years leading up to that, um, and uh, included California, Oregon, Washington, as well as British Columbia. So a truly West Coast wide effort. Um, so where, just very quickly, they came from um, was, you know, back in 2012 when the uh, Washington Blue Ribbon effort on ocean acidification was concluding its work, um, we recognized in California that we wanted to build on that, that we needed to act, and um, the, the opportunity we saw was for a scientific panel. And this speaks a little bit to the role of the science advisor. So Skyly was talking earlier about how we coordinate all aspects of the science advisory team in California. Um, the Ocean Science Trust ED also serves as the science advisor to the Ocean Protection Council and a member of the science advisory team and a member of the leadership of the science advisory team. So there's this this link there and um, the need for the, the, what was then initially being thought of as a California panel was uh, recognized by Skyly in that role um, who you know, went to the state and said Washington is finishing this major effort. There was you know, die offs obviously up and down the Pacific North, uh, West Coast. Um, and we have a really unique opportunity to build on that because we have other management drivers around this issue in California. There was litigation over water quality um, uh, in Washington, but their, our state water boards were also under a heavy amount of pressure from stakeholders to do something about OA. And the Ocean Protection Council itself, their mission is 
healthy ocean and coastal ecosystems. So we had these other mandates who were coming at this issue and we recognized a need to uptake what Washington did and build on that because ocean acidification is not a, a singular state. It's not just something that kills a lot of shellfish. It's a process that's of changing ocean chemistry that's impacting many resources we cared about. So we wanted to have a science panel come in and build that understanding. And from there, it was really uh, the strong work of the Ocean Protection Council who took in that scientific advice, asked for the panel, and then also began um, working with the other states in the region to build agreement and actually build a, uh, ultimately what became a West Coast-wide effort and include <laughs> scientists from up and down the coast. <laughs> well, and that's, uh, if I can interrupt, <laughs> interesting that yes. at that point, you know, Kat Coleman, who was then the executive director of, of the um, Ocean Protection Council and also an assistant secretary in the California Resources Agency, called and said, I've gotten marching orders to set up this panel, but it's not, you know, the conception was, okay, Washington did a, uh, its blue ribbon panel addressing Washington, but we know this is California current wide, this is West Coast wide, you know, we have to communicate to people that we're filling in the blanks for the rest of the coast, if you will. Um, so, you know, if we're setting up this panel in California, it really needs to be a West Coast wide panel, or at least let's start with California and Oregon, you know, working on this together. And so our governor's office and the resources agency um, uh, signed a memorandum of agreement to support a, a joint West Coast ocean acidification and hypoxia, very important for Oregon in particular, Northern California, but then Oregon has you know a significant hypoxia problem. Washington does also, but, but that was um, those twin, not only the chemical, but mm -hmm. the, well, maybe that is. There's a feedback loop yes. between OA and yeah. hypoxia, yeah. Um, and temperature and all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So that started the the process and then you know quickly it, it became kind of a west coast wide you know call to action and with academics from up and down the coast but we managed to you know point in you know you, you'd gotten francis chan on the panel and we like here's these four other oregonians we'd like to see on the, on the panel as well and you graciously uh, accepted and i think we in particular had a very strong fisheries focus among our um, contingent and so that i think helped with uh, one of the amazing things that I'm sure you'll talk about is just that interdisciplinary um, discipline that you all impose that, that these types of scientists couldn't be siloed. They have to you know, talk across disciplines. So anyway, sorry to interrupt, but I wanted to no, interject. The no, 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 that's a... Thing. Yeah, I was just saying, it, it was a political force happening, too, because mm -hmm. Kevin Ranker up in Washington, who worked on the Blue Ribbon Panel, was yes. also interested in, and he happened to be in Penwar, which is the Southwest Economic Region which, president, yes. uh, which I'm involved in. And so now he president. wanted to get in close, not next year president. Oh, next year president. Okay. And so then he wanted to get British Columbia at least engaged. We tried to get Alaska with all the governors. They decided to opt out. But, I mean, it became a very big political deal a few years ago mm -hmm. uh, with all the governors signing agreements and all the other people. But... Um, it was the trust that had resources and all kinds of stuff to bring yeah. the people together to have it happen. But you know, it is a, and it was in in that light that we got stuff done here. We were also having the same issues with you with respect to whether we're going to have protected areas on the coast. Mm -hmm. That was the big, I think, impetus to having this come out, mm -hmm. our ocean trust. So you came out before that and had to deal with it as it was happening. We on the coast suffered through many years of. Uh, conversations about what that was going to look like and how much and all of those kinds of things. And out of that was an understanding from a lot of us on the coast that we need to have science involved, not just picking places on the coast. We needed to have reasons behind it. And we had a little group that got together for a while to have that conversation, which led to this. So um, it's really interesting um, how the political, scientific, and all that kind of stuff came together around this. Well, really an emergency. I mean, hypoxia in 2007, 8, 9, was a big problem for our oyster producers. I, I would also say that the British Columbia edition uh, was brilliant. We had yeah. two very beleaguered scientists from British Columbia <laughs> under the Harper administration just going, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and we're like, all right, we'll let you play because we feel sorry for you. But then next thing you know, we've got an international panel. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was awesome. Exactly. It's true. <laughs> And sure. I think another piece of that is the, the sort of politics lined up, the policy needs, the jurisdictional needs, and that pulled the scientists out of their, in their disciplinary silos. So you kind of had this lifting 
through this challenge that we all share and throughout the life of the panel as the panel moved forward that really informed and, and um, advanced their work so the way they would have done their products had they not had this sort of relationship with decision makers in each state and across the region as cultivated and facilitated by Ocean Science Trust um, they would not have been capable of producing the kinds of products that they produced, which lined up very closely with decision making. So it was that constant, almost maintenance and creation of a relationship. Um, you can go to the next one, where we all were also able to learn from each other. I think that was the key as we set up this ability to learn from each other. Oops, this one got, this one got it's a little hard like, to read. <laughs> we shouldn't have put the picture there. We had it transparent. <coughs> we just anyway. want you to see the seagrass. Yeah, <laughs> that's seagrass. It removes CO2 from seagrass. <laughs> it's a really good thing. Especially on Trust us, it's a good thing. <laughs> but the, so the role of Ocean Science Trust in, um, in facilitating and stewarding the panel was more than just a, a kind of coordination role, and that's, that's the key. Um, we, in the very beginning, and, and also in collaboration with the Institute for Natural Resources here in um, Oregon did a full-on science needs assessment of state and regional and federal decision makers to, uh, across jurisdictions to understand the needs that the panel should address. And that information, the cool thing about that information is it kind of created our baseline of questions to the panel and we put those forward to the panelists and were able to have a conversation with them about what kind of products they should produce. They started getting things on paper. They started having a layout of what they wanted to do. But while that was happening, I think all of us kind of matured on the issue, and then the science needs continued to evolve. And our role became um, keeping the panel up with the decision makers, as the decision makers built stronger ties with each other, whether, whether it was the Pacific Coast Collaborative, which kind of took up the panel region-wide, and then they were capturing the attention of the federal government, um, bringing them kind of to the table with the panel, and that was leading to kind of additional conversations that continued to, to sort of up the game of the panel products. I, I want to say, not, sorry to cut you up, but this is something that you and I were talking about in real time. And, I, and to your point about fisheries and hypoxia, um, Emily led the effort in California to understand the science needs and it was it, around OA, and it was all water quality. Yes. It, was, it was all water quality. And we were just pushing and pushing and pushing on our fisheries folks to say, what do you care about? And they were like, no, nah, not so much. And, we were, and so honestly, to bring Oregon on board, we were rubbing our hands because we got the kinds of questions to challenge the panel with that we couldn't get out of California. Yeah. So we made it much more robust by having the different political uh, priorities merge around the panel. I mean, just to make it concrete for the folks around the table here, what, what as part of, you know, I, I saw the assessment that you all had been doing of your agency. And you were just <laughs> so, no, 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 not at all. Uh, on the contrary, the, the framework, you know, took that, cleaned out what was on the inside, but then convened uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife, Department of Agriculture, DEQ, and um, Parks, and DLCD, and also made them pay for the Institute of National Resources helping with all this. Um, and so got some end of, end of year money out of, out of all of them. DSL also? No, I can't remember now. Um, and had Institute for Natural Resources, uh, you know, identified who they needed to start with in each of the agencies, and then they did that assessment. They contacted not only agency folks, but soil water conservation districts, and, you know, they, they really assessed a broad array of people. And, um, and those folks, and, and the question was, what are your ocean acidification questions? What are your management relevant questions in this field? What are you concerned about? What do you see on the horizon? And so, and it did do, actually, you know, thank you, uh, Skyway, what you noted, it really complemented something that hadn't been um, reflected very strongly in the California assessment, again, because fisheries especially was such a priority for, for Oregon. So We were so grateful to have yeah. it, and we were just like, finally, because we... Yeah. yeah. And, and that's, again, another, I, I mentioned the interdisciplinary issue, but the other amazing thing about that panel is, you know, how many times, I, yeah, I've been working on this stuff for 25 years, and fighting for management relevant science, do you hand scientists, you know, <coughs> marching orders and say, please answer these questions we have, and a whole, whole interdisciplinary team steps up and says, yes, we will answer your questions. And so that, that was another 
amazing thing about, about the panel. We'll go to the next one. The next one. <laughs> yeah, just I think interest of time. So you know, the the panel um, created a true West Coast wide effort over <coughs> a, an impact and a process we were all experiencing and concerned about ocean acidification and hypoxia. And you know, one thing that Kat Coleman used to say that I think always resonated very strongly with me is that OA especially is one of those issues that everybody is concerned about and thinks is a priority, but it flies above their silo. It's sort of like water boards or you know, fisheries might be interested, but they're, they weren't seeing what they could actually do about it. And so it can kind of fly above everybody's radar. And um, with the panel, we were able to generate multiple kinds of products to align with each of those needs. So we had a very water quality specific product where uh, the, the panelists essentially went through like the 303D process, pinpointed the science needs associated with that, and synthesized what you would know to actually do something that would be ecologically relevant to impacts from ocean acidification, and therefore kind of made the, pro the problem tractable. So it kind of took this big thing that everybody was like, whoa, it's globally driven essentially by emissions. It's... Um, it's uh, magnified by our upwelling system along the whole West Coast. What do you do about that at a state or a local level? Like, what is the piece of that that any one jurisdiction could own and feel some kind of um, uh, assurance that it would, there would be a benefit, there would be uh, something worth that cost? And that really captured, I think, the attention of federal partners who not only have um, expertise, you know, potential funding, potential resources to bring to the table, but who are actively looking, f looking for ways to collaborate better with the states and understand state priorities and be and bring potentially federal resources to the table that will help, you know, uh, address the issue within state waters, but also within federal waters as well. So groups like the Interagency Working Group on Ocean Acidification in, in Washington, D.C., which is led by NOAA's Ocean Acidification Program, were very, um, very, very interested in the work of the panel because of that kind of ground swell up from the West Coast that went to the level of the governors, and then the governors' um, people Found were going to D.C. And, 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 and finding ways to partner on it. So you can go to the next one, too. And so you can click through, and then there's a couple more, and one more. So these are just, like, if you look on the panel's website, which is westcoastoah.org, you will see a whole spectrum of different kinds of products, everything from scientific publications to technical guidance documents that were all scoped to different decision maker needs and different levels of decision making. So the water quality one I was describing was very, you know, focused on the jurisdiction of EPA and, and the water quality agencies. But then there were also these sort of high level policy white papers that were produced that put forth a vision for how science can mobilize better on this issue on behalf of decision making and how monitoring can be more decision focused and um, and serve multiple management needs and become a common pool of data that different users can draw from, whether they be agencies or even hatchery managers or stakeholders or, or whatever that is. So they just have a, a very broad range of content behind their work. And that culminated in, if you want to go to the next one, this, the major findings, recommendations, and actions, and this this gets to that useful, relevant piece where, you know, everybody's talking about the, the guys having kidney failure, but who's going to get them a drink of water? This is the drink of water, or the, the panel sort of um, attempt to take all of that thinking, all of that content, and boil it down into very specific recommendations that get at what you should try to shoot for in the coming years to get at the issue, and then specific actions that could be taken within in the immediate term to get the ball rolling towards achieving the recommendation. So it takes this large, seemingly insurmountable problem and attempts from a scientific perspective to make it doable. So that was the kind of culminating product. 
And I think, like, just overall, you know, the panel changed the conversation. You know, that what this is about is managing for changing ocean conditions. It's ocean acidification, it's hypoxia, it's weird events are increasing and are expected to increase, like harmful algal blooms, which both states are, are suffering from right now. Um, it's warming temperatures all at the same time. The panel came up with a very strong multiple stressor problem, requires it being attacked from all management and policy angles. And the major findings then shoot to say, here's the multiple management fronts you can attack it from. So, um, I think you can skip this one and just go to... So just a ma as a matter of looking forward, um, we in California are kind of brought the panel back to the OPC science advisory team and have come up with next steps to address the science needs associated with a whole bulk of the recommendations. So the science advisory team, which kind of breathes new life into this because, you know, the panel got to the end and it, like, got the thing over the finish line, and then they were like, I'm tired, leave me alone. And, um, and we kind of brought that back to the set, which is 26 other people who were like kind of raring to go. And, um, and we had a meeting on April 18th where we brought all of them together and we did this deep dive into the panel's recommendations and actions alongside state decision makers from across jurisdictions said, how can we carry the science needs related to these recommendations and actions forward? Um, and so we can go to the next one. Oh, I didn't skip that one. And then, so just as a, to leave you with, um, the science advisory team is forming um, an aquatic vegetative habitats working group to think about the role of vegetation in sequestering carbon and ameliorating OA. Um, it's formed a climate change and fisheries working group that is looking at scenarios uh, under future change, like changes in productivity, and how that aligns with the management options you have before you that you could pull um, in the face of those different scenarios. Um, we're building up a harmful algal blooms effort right now. Um, in California, the Dungeness crab fishery was shut down because of the Demoic acid bloom. Oh, That's the yeah. 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 And and but in California it was the first time. I don't know if that um, is the first time here. It was the first time a fishery was shut it down. It didn't really matter until it happened in California. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and and there's this of course this growing message that these events are expected that we're no longer sheltered from things the Pacific Northwest has actually learned to deal better with, frankly. Our response to HABs and the, the processes that we have in place is very different than up here and so people are you know rightfully freaking out about okay how can we put in a better system to uh, detect HABs respond to HABs and get that information out there to the community um, and of course water quality and we're, we we want to use our marine protected areas to begin addressing that challenge of do they in fact confer resilience in the face of climate change um, and there are from across these, I think, really great opportunities for the region to, um, and the states to continue to partner. So I think the, the sort of leaving thought that I just want to end on is to say how um, excited we are at the California Ocean Science Trust about the conversations happening here in the Oregon Ocean Science Trust and look for those opportunities to partner learn from each other, whether it's across issues that we each are better at dealing with or have more experience with, um, as well as kind of pull our resources, because the West Coast panel, of course, was a great, great success in that regard. It doesn't always have to be that big either, so. Um, but can I'll, we have Francis? Yeah. Yeah, actually. Yeah. 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 like get back to Steve and Allie, like me saying like, we'll give you Steve and Allie for Francis. <laughs> Somebody call them up and be like, Emily, you said. <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm here now because I just, uh, part of the uptake in um, Oregon 
of this work has a lot of it is, is happening through the Pacific Coast Collaborative, which is this you know, collaborative among the, the governor's offices and the, the premier of British Columbia. Um, and uh, one real tangible way, and Karin is, is, is in the leadership in, uh, you know, of that, is the um, in, in terms of engaging the federal government is an agreement by the, that interagency working group um, that's kind of out of the White House, but coordinated the White House. Uh, to put up a monitoring task force to look at how we can. This was part of the big thing. We wanted to convince the feds, look, this is ground zero for OA and hypoxia. As we go, so will go the rest of the nation. This is the play. And we are organizing and, and you know, doing a lot of good work that is cost effective to make the best use of investments in science. And please join with us uh, on this. And you know, while they are excited about it and are getting more and more excited about it, I, I will, you know, be more blunt or candid to say, you know, it, it took some persuading. And, and they, um, you know, I have to say part of the mindset a little bit was, oh, the folks in the West Coast, they're, they're already doing things. We really need to work with those folks who don't have OA on the radar. That's right. You guys are okay on your own, mm. and, and we, you don't need our help. The most vulnerable places are the places where, you know, it's going to hit them and they're not even aware of it. And, you know, there's some validity to that argument to some degree, but also we, we're all at the forefront of figuring out the solutions. And so let's, let's, you know, we really need to work where people are mobilizing because it's hitting us earliest and hardest, you know, to deal with this. So, you know, I want to say that um, a couple of weeks ago, um, I was with Francis at the Gordon Research Conference in, in New Hampshire, yeah. and this was the global uh, change uh, Global Ocean Change Biology Conference, and Libby and I were the only two non-scientists there. So a hundred of the smartest people in the world, um, and it's these are kind of weird conferences. They're sort of think tanky, and I didn't know what I was getting into when I went, and I was all, oh, I'm so out of my depth right now. <laughs> They're going to find out any minute. Um, and I finished by talking about the panel, and, and Francis was fabulous in talking about the value of it. And Libby sort of was like, Oh, the panel again. So some light bulbs were going off with her, and and one of the things in my new role with the with the Nature Conservancy is to pick up those recommendations and think about what resilience looks like. So as we think about the Restore Act funding twenty billion dollars in the Gulf, what does resilience in in habitat structure and function and complexity look like, and how do we begin to measure it, and how do we use those funding? Uh, in, a, in a way that, you know, gets that ecosystem as robust as possible against these kinds of things. So, I mean, I'm trying to keep the, the panel recommendations alive. We're talking to USGS about it for the Mid-Atlantic and so forth. So, um, anyway. And, and so, in, in other venues in Oregon where I think the panel recommendations and kind of these approaches are, are going to uh, hopefully find a home, um, I'll note that, as you know from Kevin Ranker, you know, State of Washington has multiple, or at least a couple pieces of legislation that are ocean acidification focused. In California, did your legislation pass already? Not yet. No. Not yet. Okay, but but the California legislature is actively um, taking up two ocean acidification related bills. Some focused on um, mitigation actions, seagrass, kelp yeah. bed, those types of things. I can't remember what the other one is. The other one's a little more of a catch-all for like several of them. Okay. Um, I have a placeholder bill in for drafting um, with legislative council um, just to get things forward and try and, and um, get a starting point, but I expect to, uh, to you know, likely that will you know, turn over to legislative partners um, to, to carry forward, but just to get things going, um, you know, have Oregon have its own um, OA, you know, recognition of OA as a significant policy issue for the state and uh, um, identifying some needs for good coordination and cooperation among the Ocean Science Trust, the Marine Studies Initiative at Oregon State University, the Ocean Policy Advisory Council, you know, other, and, and then key state agencies as a framework for um, Oregon having its own, uh, being able to tell its own ocean acidification story. And I think that statutory uh, recognition and, and priority identification is going to be really important for the state and send a message to funders that it's a priority for the state, um, for example, and also ensure that Oregon tells, I, by identifying who the key players are, that Oregon tells its own story. You know, because I already famously repeated, I think, to you all, you know, we're, we're seeing Whiskey Creek shellfish hatchery being set in Maine rather than, 
you know, in Oregon. <laughs> and so, Neat Arts Bay. Uh, yes, right. <laughs> and, and so, um, so anyway, so that's just one other piece of where um, we're building an infrastructure, hopefully in Oregon, to, to take up and act on the really practical recommendations that are in the report from the and, task force. And the truth is Your that scientific. we are finding these interesting issues about different um, parks and different bays along the coast. So mm -hmm. some ocean acidification, ocean acidification seems to be impacting them a lot. Others, not at all. Other, and it is that kind of information that can help you what makes a healthy ecosystem, what does give resilience to it, and what are the characteristics of those places that can be passed on. And if you don't do it here, the East Coast is going to be not have the tools that they need, and then maybe Absolutely. they need to, maybe they need the tools ahead of time so they can start working on it yeah. long before they get Absolutely. the problem. And in particular, the Gulf. And with both of them, with sea rice, going to go underwater. If they don't take care of their land base, which is going to be submerged at some point, full of all sorts of other problems <coughs> that create problems for the environment once it's underwater, they're in real trouble. And they're in trouble anyway. But if if they can't learn from the stuff on the west coast. They are not going to get to prepare themselves for what they're going to have to deal with. And I, you know, the Atlantic Ocean is so much different than the Pacific and the whole infrastructure and the, the way the currents go. But they're going to have these problems. Uh, there's just too much carbon dioxide in the world right now. So uh, eventually going to happen. So how, how do we help that? How do we use that to build the kind of things we need here? So we do need to talk more about the, the bill. So questions from uh, trust members. I've got a couple which are going to get into nitty-gritty <laughs> uh, structural stuff. But So I, are you a 501c3? We are. But also a government entity? We are not a government entity. Okay. So did you start as a government entity? We did not. Okay. So that's the neither fish nor fowl. So the interesting thing is... We are, um, by IRS uh, designation, a 501c3 and report as a 501c3, and I lay claim to that and plant that flag. Um, the formal link is that the secretary chooses our board, but we are independent and outside of the government. So, um, oh, interesting. and there hasn't, you know. And the IRS didn't have any problem with the, the government not so far. Our board. Interesting. Not so far. Interesting. Um, it, but again, um, there is not a perfect designation for what we are because we, we just fill a void and swing both ways. Um, and it's, it's imperfect right now. And we run into structural difficulties all the time. One of them is we were able to take state funding because there's an Ocean Protection Council that can disperse funding uh, fairly. But, but the Department of Fish and Wildlife said, can you help us think about this thing with lobster? And we'd say, yes, it's going to cost you this much money. And they're like, we can't give you money. And the conversation would die on the vine. So they would say, well, Ocean Protection Council, can you do us a solid and give them money on our problem? But, 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 and that's imperfect. So one of the things we need to figure out is we don't want to necessarily be competing with everybody else for this when, you know, it's, it's not straightforward. And you run a grant program or an RFP uh, we, program? Or? Uh, we are about to with monitoring funding. That changed, I think, the moment Cat left. <laughs> so, you know, there's some steep change happening within the Ocean Protection Council. Um, and we've had minor grant programs with additional funding. The, obviously, the intention was for us to be a grantor to consolidate mm -hmm. um, funding and disperse it appropriately, and there's uh, and that's in the offing. So, for example, the legislation that allows for partial decommissioning instead of full decommissioning, or the consideration of partial decommissioning of our platforms, will generate when the time comes, probably not too distant future, hundreds of millions of dollars. That is intended from the oil companies. From they the have to pay because they're they're required right now. They're required to to with, remove the the platforms under their original agreements, and this is going to modify that, and they're going to have to pay for that. Yeah, so the legislation's passed to allow them to do partial, which saves the money. That money goes into the. The other uh, conversation was around mitigation funds, and again, we run into these structural issues. So once through cooling, was. Uh, the, the mitigation for once through cooling in our power plants was intended to support marine protected areas, uh, including monitoring and the mechanism to have that land with the Ocean Science Trust, where our board member who is in charge of that, and John Bishop, 
said, we're, we just can't legally make that happen. So there's going to be some legislative cleanups for us to do more directly take that money without giving up our independent status. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a tough one. Yeah. Okay. There's a precedent in um, the energy um, facility siting related law of uh, state statute that sets up a provision that a 501c3 that looks like this is eligible to receive mitigation funds from the uh, establishment of a new uh, gas-powered turbine um, energy plant. So it doesn't say this organization can get it, but only an organization that has these characteristics. And that's how they channeled funding to what was then the Oregon Climate Trust, now the Climate Trust for Climate Mitigation uh, Projects. Oh, interesting. So That's helpful. Okay. Other questions from folks? Karin, you want to? I just, I, I wanted to just highlight a couple of things that are tying together some of the Ocean Science Trust workshop, the, the Oregon Ocean Science <laughs> workshop that happened in May, and um, what um, the uh, OA inventory task force that Gabriella mentioned are doing, and, and that is really picking up on one of the science panel's recommendations to have really solid um, inventory of monitoring and um, make sure that that infrastructure of both prof you know, professionals, experts doing it, as well as any technical infrastructure, physical infrastructure, um, remains and continues because that long-term data is so critical to us detecting trends and the degree of those trends, and then how we actually can respond to it and what we need to respond to. Um, and so um, I'm happy to say that both um, Burke Hales and Francis Chan are going to be helping with that task force this summer and fall to inventory not only the chemical oceanography infrastructure and efforts, um, but also start weaving in biological monitoring mm -hmm. efforts into a greater inventory that can then serve as the seed for a much larger group of experts to work on and say, yes, there's, or there's another effort, or we need to really focus on this gap here, make this a priority so that we have well thought out, um, comprehensive understanding of how to make that coast-wide monitoring network as rigorous as possible to give us the best information about these trends, both spatially and temporally. So it's really exciting. It feeds into a lot of the things you guys have already heard a lot about and have already expressed a lot of interest in and um, is, is one tiny step forward in terms of looking for low hanging fruit and what we can do next. It's a very tangible next step that we can do to make you know, decision making better informed and more solid. So. Great. Well, um, Thank you both for coming. It's been very insightful. Um, I want to go back kind of more on Louise's track in terms of structuring a trust. Um, because one of the things that I think is one of the big differences between how California and Oregon trusts would be structured is how many staff roughly <laughs> does the California Ocean Science Trust have? We're about 20 now. We're we've, about been as, 20. we've been as high as the high 20s, and we've been as low as four. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I've seen yeah. that yeah. Um, in my earlier investigations a long time ago, just kind of looking at that structure. It seemed very different from how we're intending to, to, um, to structure. I guess I'd just be curious. Um, you said that the intention was to be able to... Um, aggregate funds and distribute them through a grant program that's much more in line with I think our mm -hmm. our targeted mission. These are two different approaches. So I'm wondering if you have any insights or lessons learned along the way in terms of how those two different approaches or, or missions have played out in your experience. Um, yes. So maybe this is helpful or the that we have a lot of staff because there was, um, by happy coincidence, there were people that needed a place to put their money. 
right? So we needed, we had, right? It was, it, I, I, I remember sitting at a table with the, with the secretary and um, the people at RLF and Packard, and they went, well, we gave the Ocean Science Trust this much. Well, we gave them this much. And I'm like, keep talking, keep talking. <laughs> and uh, did, I think they're higher. Oh, no, we're not. And I came out of there going, I'm very skilled at this. Um, and it had nothing to do with me. But, um, but it, it, because of the marine protected areas, um, this was a philanthropic priority with so many philanthropies, and it was a, a state priority that they needed to merge that funding. And that supported um, what everybody agreed was going to be um, a staffed program to serve as the conveners and pull as many people to the table, and hence we needed the staff for that. What um, we are consciously aware of is that when we get to the place of being more explicit funders, we don't want to compete with um, Sea Grant, right. for example. We don't want to be just another funding that sends out this and then more science and more grad students and more of this. It would, we, we were thinking, you know, what is the best solutions sort of oriented funding and it might be a big RFP and it might be a consultant right here, <laughs> it might be you know, hiring a bunch of citizen scientists or something here. It might take these very different forms rather than always these big research RFPs that go out all the time. And that the Ocean Science Trust staff themselves would really be doing the shuttle diplomacy to make sure that the work is happening and, and will fit into where it needs to go. So another opportunity, um, and we've done a little bit of this, but I'd like to deepen it, is to think about a fellowship program. You know, rather than just giving money for someone to do science, why, why don't you say, we want to partner with um, this UC Davis or UC Santa Barbara or pick one, and um, you know, here's a two-year fellowship for research. And then what you get out of that is um, somebody who's completely been inculcated in the idea of solutions-based research, you know, and, and to sort of change the community structure a little bit and people in scientific relationship to societal issues. So the um, example that you mentioned about lobsters, mm -hmm. um, state agency says we need help with lobsters. You say, okay, it's gonna, we have scientists, it's going to cost you this much to do it. Well, we can't do it. That's kind of a one directional uh -huh. thing that couldn't happen. Can the other direction work for you? Um, can you take money from your various sources and give it to the state agency under your 501c3 status to have them do the lobster research that they need to do? Yes, that okay. can structurally happen. What it hasn't, because we're not dumb. No, it hasn't because of <laughs> 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 um, But more often what would happen is we would get funding, extramural funding, like philanthropic funding, because we would have uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife saying, can you help us think through this abalone, how we're managing our abalone, for example. Um, and we would say, yes, we'll partner with you on that, and we'll try to bring this other money in. So what we added was capacity rather than funding, because often the, it, it, their limitation wasn't often funding and money, it was the capacity to do the work, and we would provide them the capacity to do the work. And the, the other piece of it, uh, with fisheries in, in particular, too, is how the need kind of arose, which was them actually wanting it to happen outside their doors, because they were there were issues where uh, fishing stakeholders were upset, and by saying, Ocean Science Trust, do this for us, there was more legitimacy in the process in the eyes of the stakeholders that they were actually trying to address. We provided some cover mm -hmm. a couple uh -huh. of times. And, yeah. and it demonstrated the department's willingness to say, okay, yes, independent science, give me the answer, and we're not going to, you know, even if they wouldn't have otherwise, that there were just situations where some trust was lost, and, um, and so they were more or less wanting us to undertake it. And have you developed that trust with fishing? Because I will tell you that our fishing committee on the West Oregon coast was really frightened to death of the Oregon um, um, I, And they heard it from their other fishermen friends down there. Yeah, I, and I think that that's correct. I think that we have um, begun to develop that trust. We have a long, long, long way to go. Because yeah. that was a big issue with the, reason, the way this one was set up, yeah. because of the hard-fought fights on yeah. our coast about where we're going to put marine protected areas. Uh, lined up clearly, non fishermen on one side, yep. all these other environmental groups on the other side, and the battle developed a real distrust of each other yeah. in a whole lot of ways. And 
one of the reasons the trust because I had felt like everybody's got to get together somewhere. You have to figure out a way to build that back, and you have to figure out a way to be independent because people made decisions based on the way things were happening. That certain agencies were now in the pocket of the environmentalists and they weren't listening to my natural resource people. I mean, it was it was a really dysfunctional and hard fought deal. I mean, yeah. many of our legislators got all caught up in it in really negative ways back and forth. And so we put together this other group that kind of list, brought everybody together and, and came up with recommendations which led to this uh, with an understanding that what we're trying to do is form a group that does independent science, that both sides could trust the, out, the outcome. And when I heard the kinds of feelings that we were hearing from our fishermen related to us from the other yeah. fishermen, I didn't know that you could ever get there in California. Well, I'll tell you what, um, you know what, one of the biggest snags in that relationship building was that we took money from the Packard Foundation. I, no, that's the same with that. Yeah, I mean, that's and, the same and, with and um, so they Not just Packard. assumed, and I, I went to, I did all of these gymnastics to create what I called this, this organizational firewall right. so that funders and even yeah. board members could not influence the outcome of the products and that people would agree to and sign off on the process and then we would do and you know what those are transaction costs so the product just got a whole lot more expensive <laughs> you know, trust is expensive yeah. and um and uh we have uh, some luminary fishermen who see the value of what we're trying to do but we have not gained the trust of nearly enough of them that's work in progress and it's really a shame because I think we consider them absolutely paramount to these conversations. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. I think I mean, that holy they're well. fine. The, the future of fishing industry is dependent on getting some of this stuff right. That's right. And in so, you know, I think some of this um, evolution in, 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 has come with the marine protected areas, certainly in California, um, with a couple of the fisheries projects that we've taken on, like the abalone review, um, the harmful algal blooms <coughs> work we're doing right now. And in those situations, we're actually still a little bit of a blank slate to them, where we're a new voice in it. A lot of that struggle comes from the MPAs, but on the fisheries piece, um, we're, I think it's almost like we're just starting to build that relationship. So are those priorities um, just kind of maybe delving a little deeper into your firewall building? Because that's the stage that we're at now. <laughs> important to me, and it, and it seems possible, but I'm not sure if I'm hearing that it's maybe not possible. When you say we're going to fund abalone, uh, harmful algal wounds, etc., are those priorities that you had, that your board had established before the money came in to say we are interested in funding these things? No, not mm -hmm. at the project level. I remember going to the board and saying, you know, we've got a lot of things to work on and a lot of these things are state priorities, but which ones of those things will help us regain this trust of lost constituencies or constituencies who just, you know, don't want to engage? Because I was desperate to create sort of this repository of fair and equitable <coughs> solutions <laughs> so that we can keep pointing to them. Um, so we didn't, we didn't, the board didn't tee them up that way, but I'll tell you, it got, one of the things that worked for us, one of the things that I inherited was the oil and gas platform decommissioning study, which just divided the constituents in all kinds of weird ways. So suddenly the recreational fishermen really wanted to see partial decommissioning because they went out and they fished on these submerged rigs. The commercial fishermen hated them. The conservationists hated them. <laughs> so you've got the conservationists on the same side of the commercial fishermen, and you've got the oil companies and the wreck fishermen, so it divided it in really weird ways. And it landed in a place that was a big fat duh, which is let's consider each rig and decide what the best solution is based on those. And the, commercial fi the recreational fishermen would come up to me afterwards and go, you had my back, didn't you? And I'm like, uh, I wasn't working for you, and they're like, I know. And here comes the next thing, <laughs> and the commercial fisherman hated me, and the next one landed on the side of the commercial fisherman, and the rep would be like, well, I thought we had a, a what, what, I thought you were a, and I'm like, no, actually, I don't work for you, it's, it's like, so t we actually ended up putting a few different issues that landed, you know, in different wind columns, and slowly people were like, oh, they're a little bit impartial, and that helped. But prioritizing them, so to say the abalone one, for example, is around wreck fishermen, and they loved it. 
and um, and the Habs is around yeah. commercial fishermen, and they're really excited to see us involved. But obviously, but where did that come from? I guess is the where the, the issue come the from? issue was raised at the state level. We okay. need help with this. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, that's a good point. You know, you look at like Ocean Science Trust, our list of projects or our program areas or whatever on our website, if it's HABs or this or that, a lot of that, those choices, we tended to work in a, a sort of responsive to state needs mode that established our program areas versus another organization like Center for Ocean Solutions, as an example, which is based out of Stanford University, their program areas, they, you know, they identified internally. They took a different tact on what they chose to work on based on their jurisdiction and their scope and all of their considerations. But ours have been driven by state needs, and then we use that built-in interest in the issue to maybe push it further than it would have gone otherwise, I think. Generally you spend your money in the near shore? Inside three months, your membership? Yes. Okay. Yeah, the panel is actually, the West Coast panel is the first time. Yeah. That, yeah, that we worked beyond <coughs> yeah. in California. Yeah. Uh, our West platforms went out. But yeah. Other questions? Hey, I have a question. Can hey. I speak up? Go for it. So thank you, Skyly and Emily, for coming. This is great. Um, it's really nice to hear about your project. I'm curious if you could speak to the group about the MPA monitoring work that you guys did, that Sherry did, because um, it seems like it could align with what we're trying to set up for our monitoring, um, our monitoring here on the Oregon coast, where specifically I think the trust is grappling with, you know, how prescriptive to be uh, if we do open up a grant program and how um, sort of the opposite of that, right, how non-prescriptive to be. And if do you remind, you know, I worked on that a long time ago, and I don't know if everyone has the knowledge base that I do on that. Um, remind us what you all did, and then once you had developed the structure for the monitoring, did you then go and um, outsource pieces of that, or did you? How, how did that all work? Well, first of all, hi, Emily. Uh, nice to hear your voice again, and um, <laughs> thank you for the question. Yeah. I'll, I'll make it quick, but... Um, one of the first things that was decided, and this was with the Ocean Protection Council, the Ocean Science Trust, um, and the Department of Fish and Wildlife at the time, and this was several years ago, was that in order to evaluate the effectiveness of the network of marine protected areas, we could never afford to um, count everything, right? Um, you can't just go in and let's just do um, a, a biodiversity assessment. So rather, since the legislation called for um, enhancing the structure, function, and integrity of the entire coast, not just inside the MPAs, but the MPAs are a tool to make the entire coast better, there was no guidance on what structure, function, and integrity uh, of, of our ecosystems was. So to, to have a mandate that says, go forth and make ocean health better, we, we had to find what those pulse points is in a way that scientists would agree. and. And so, therefore, our monitoring plans were um, built around ecosystems. And, you know, what does this LINCOG <laughs> of these size classes tell you about the rest of the ecosystem underneath it? You know, what does it tell So if you go down there and you're not finding predators or, or something, then, uh, then that's going to tell you a great deal about the health of it. So it had to do with... Um, uh, what we knew about ecosystem structure um, and and complexity and finding those very specific pulse points and you know our analogy is you go to the doctor and blood pressure and you know we're going to test five things and we can 95 percent say you're not dying of, of some horrible disease but um, but you can't measure every single thing we're not going to get full body scans every time we go so that was a piece of it where we ended up with that is to say well this Actually, um, now that we have uh, what the uh, uh, Fish and Game Commission has adopted into policy as our monitoring plan based on ecosystem ser services, structure, function, integrity, how do we actually measure that? Mm -hmm. And that's where we were saying, um, well, we need um, a different kind of an army of people out there doing it because we're not just going to give these big grants to big universities every year. So how often do we do this and what does monitoring look like it? And that's where we ended up saying, well, let's organize 
these very disparate communities around an agreed upon monitoring plan and chunk off pieces. So what can a bunch of graduate students do, you know, right off of Stanford where it's at Hopkins or something, and what can fishermen help with, and what can these other pieces, uh, citizen science, reef check, and so forth, undertake? And we would knit together and cobble together this plan and try to, as parsimoniously as possible, get it funded incentivize graduate students to build their uh, doctoral program around monitoring, <laughs> you know, and get it for free because they'll go to NSF and pull that money in and those kinds of things. And so I think that answers your question, Emily, that we, we thought about it in terms of pulse points of, of what the indicators of ecosystem health were, and then we tried to draw in different, different actors to help us gather those data. The other piece too. And so, how, what's the status now? I mean, and so when you say you draw on different pieces, pieces of people to do that work, then is that in an RFP process, or how is that? How has that been done? It is. It is an, an RFP process um, uh, that has been led by the Ocean Science Trust and distributed by the Ocean Protection Council. So that money doesn't come. Has not until now uh, come in our doors. That was Ocean Protection Council bond money, Prop eighty four that would be distributed mm -hmm. and we would shape the RFP. And, and part of what was difficult was that we would um, solicit people to respond to it and then the Ocean Science Trust would build the program. So we would pull all of these people together and say, we're going to shave a little off of you and tease a little more out of you and if both of you are redundant, so one of you's got to drop this and really do a mashup to get the most effective program and then go forth and fund it. And again, that was one of those things that everybody left a little bit mad and we were like, perfect. Um, the uh, breakthrough for us was last year we had 2.5 million come directly out of the governor's budget out of the general fund. And that mm -hmm. was the first time that this was gonna be funded um, not by bond funding, but out of the general fund. And that, that mm -hmm. conversation is presently underway whether that go, goes to um, the Ocean Protection Council to distribute or the Ocean Science Trust to distribute and there's a couple of different conversations about the best way to do that. And just to say mm -hmm. to this crowd that, you know, I participated in the conversations to extract money from our Governor Brown who is hard to extract money from and, um, <clears throat> you know, it's very impressive and the only way he would tolerate this was when we positioned the network of marine protected areas as, as a climate mitigation a adaptation tool. It's helping us understand uh, how to build resilience into this. Because if we said we need monitoring, he'd be like, smell you later. But when we're saying actually we're doing something really, really smart okay. in the oceans and, and that triggered a, a disbursement that we hope was going to be ongoing. Okay. We're well, way over time. thank we're you, little... Skelly. And I, sorry. Go ahead, Emma. I was just gonna say, <laughs> I was just gonna say to my fellow trust members that I think because of my involvement in that project, that's kind of how I've been framing our task in my head. That's how I've been thinking about what our task is for the OST. Is like this is. Um, that we would try to create some kind of monitoring framework and structure and then our RFPs would flow from that. Right. Um, and I know that may be very different than how other board members are thinking about that because it is very prescriptive as opposed to saying, well, here's a gap analysis and here's some holes and anyone that applies for some money in these holes will get funded. So just as background where I'm coming from, um, because of my work with this project, that's sort of how I'd like to see our work going forward, but I know that I'm a potentially unique voice in, in, the, in the board members. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess I just wanted to uh, maybe ask for a follow-up because I know time is short. Um, uh, Skyler, you now are in a position where you're looking at organizations all over, and the way you've described the work of the Science Trust and as this kind of boundary organization that in it that that is a service delivery organization, mm -hmm. I think that is very different than the way the Ocean Science Trust is structured. Mm -hmm. But um, having a lens on other organizations, uh, entities, science entities that might be more akin to the, you know, uh, more streamlined, if you will, <laughs> um, uh, uh, role that perhaps the, Oregon, the Ocean Science Trust is, is set up to play, and especially in its early years, that 
if, 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 from some food for thought for you for in the future, particularly in the current role as you're looking around at the science landscape, because there's so many differences between the California mm -hmm. dynamics, structure, scale, you know, impacts, all of that compared to, to um, Oregon, for one. Um, and also, we have in Oregon such a different relationship between our management agencies, particularly ODFW and our academic community Absolutely. and our scientists Huge here, difference, yeah. and a different tra a tradition of collaboration mm -hmm. yeah. um, that I think really shapes things um, I, I, you know, I, I differently. Didn't. Yeah. No way I need to suggest that the, the approach that we've taken in California would fit here. I think that these need to be really different models for, for that reason, and time is different, and, you know, uh, politics are different, issues are, are different. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is a lot, what's exciting to me is that they're taking different shape mm -hmm. in different places for different reasons. And I think they're, I mean, Let's write a paper on it. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> there, this is this is the role and value of of a boundary organization to fit into the space where it's needed, and not to do a cookie cutter one size fits all. So I, I think this is perfect. But that was a press kind of with your new hat on and yeah. a lens that you're taking around yeah. the country. Yeah. If there are if there's insights that you can share from other mm -hmm. entities that may not even be ocean entities that you may be looking at mm -hmm. to see what are good models for having science informed policy-making. There's no better model than the Nature Conservancy. I work here stuff. But, you know, um, I think the thing... State sponsors. Quasi-state sponsors. But just, just to say a half a sentence, and I know, Louise, you're, you're looking at the clock. Um, what is needed under these very steep trajectories of change is more organizations that are devoted to having agility and flexibility both in funding and in process mm -hmm. to provide uh, solutions that are science informed quickly. And that's not built into our management structure, even in Oregon, <laughs> where it's less complex. And so when you look at the National Climate Assessment, you know, there, there's investments in science that need to, because we, we don't know enough, but there's also investments in the transactions of how to bring that science. And I just can't say enough that we need to think about this transaction, these kinds of organizations. They're going to take different forms for different settings. For just, and some of them, you know, the Ocean Science Trust in California ballooned up there for a while, and it was awesome, and we had funding and we're humming, and it were, it's kind of shrinking back a little bit, which doesn't mean it's going away. It's just So to be able to sort of do this is really, really important, as, as Neil suggests. So I... Um, I, I don't know, there is no perfect one. It's the one that works. And, but there's lessons to be learned. I think the firewall lesson and mm -hmm. the process lesson and you know, building that, build what it takes to build trust, and you guys are way ahead of everybody else on that. Um, but I look at these two and I'm trying to draw lessons in, in my own work. Great, thank you again to both of you for coming. Yes. Yeah, thank, thank you for you. having thank us you. here. Can I just say, um, Gabriella? Good luck in whatever that dumb old thing is. <laughs> She's gonna take care of all of us. She's gonna take care of the ocean health, Oregon health, people's all health. Uh, so I'm just uh, in terms of managing uh, time. Uh, do we have anybody who's planning to make public comment today? Okay, so we'll come back at three o'clock, and that will get us right back on schedule. Right. So we we'll done that for a Okay.
let you take those emails. I'm dealing with sand if it's a new city. Yeah, so that one has been frustrating. And what it is, is it's happening. We don't have any choices. It's not organic. I do. It's not coming from organic. It's not coming from the world. And it's always been there. It will always be there. It's higher than the North Park Park City. It's not coming from the world. It's
seems like they're trying to stress that we're not going to put a moratorium on development resources. But during public comment, and we're good on that. All right, so the next thing I want to do is um, ask this group to uh, formally adopt these as our priority questions that um, we want answers to. And I want to do it with the caveat that it, they'll be subject to further comment when we do rulemaking. But I sent these out to all of the participants in the science workshop. Uh, to uh, folks at OPAC. Uh, it was posted on our website. We got no comments back uh, indicating good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, but I think the fact that we got no comments, I think people think we're, we're sort of hit uh, the mark. And I think the discussion I had at the OPAC meeting was sort of indicative of that, that people thought we had hit the mark in terms of the right questions. There was a question about whether the last question really captured the socioeconomic stuff. And I whoever I can't remember who made that comment at OPAC, but I said, you got a better way to word that question. Send it to us because we struggle with that one. Uh, that's what we came up with. That's the intent of that question. I never got any uh, additional feedback on that. So it may be that they went back and looked at it and thought, well, yeah, it captures what I wanted to capture. So any hesitation about doing that, any heartburn, any, you looked at them again and think, oh, we missed the mark on something. No, I we, thought they were, I thought they were really well formulated, actually, Okay, given how 
spontaneously. <laughs> and most of them are broad enough to give us a tremendous amount of flexibility. Yeah, I, I also might mention, I had uh, made a commitment when we left the last meeting that I was going to flesh these out further, and after the discussion with OPAC, it was actually, OPAC suggests, there were a couple of people at OPAC said, I don't really think you need to do that. They speak for themselves, and so I decided not to go through that, uh, of adding a whole lot more detail, and I think when we get to uh, sort of shifting these into a rule structure, there'll be an opportunity if we need to flush things out uh, further, we can do that in the rulemaking uh, process. <laughs> so what I'd like is a, a motion to um, adopt these as our priority questions subject to rulemaking. So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, is there any discussion heartburn? Okay, all those in... Emily, are you with us? I am sorry, I was on mute. I am with you. I'm, um, yep, that's fine. <laughs> I'm looking for my copy of it, but I don't have it in front of me, but I'm going to find it. <laughs> Probably not before the vote, but I trust that if it's what we decided last week or last time, I'm fine with it. Yeah, I, I might have wordsmithed them a little bit for the OPAC memo, but other than that, they're exact, there's no substantive changes. Right, Emily. On the yeah, I saw what you sent to OPAC when you sent that out that you were going to give that to the OPAC folks, and I was fine with that at that time. Okay, so all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. I, say, I think that OPAC was very appreciative of the game. Right. Yeah. I mean, I thought yeah. that was really a wise yeah. move. Yeah, I agree. And I just want to recognize that crafting these words together with five people talking at you is no small act <laughs> Chris Costelli yes. for actually massaging this through because um, that's that's a really hard thing so thank yep. you for your yes, work thank on you that. for that keeps you on your toes <laughs> we're going to test you your ability to continue doing that this next time. Right, we are we right. are we uh, open up a new word so document. yeah so i want to spend a, a little bit of time talking about a grant program criteria and i took a stab at and i'm, I'm just going to sort of run through this in terms of my thinking about what the rule structure might look like uh, and it would start with uh, that we would uh, solicit either proposals through an RFP process or uh, grant applications through a grant competitive grant process once or twice a year. Uh, that uh, we would uh, spend some time thinking about do we want to request pre-proposals before we get full-blown proposals. Uh, or just go right to full proposal uh, sort of process or full grant uh, process. So do you want you know one to two page summaries of what people are thinking about and then go request from the ones that we think hit the mark in terms of what we're looking for? Or do we want to have just a free-for-all, let them figure out what to put together in terms of answering the questions? So that's sort of a, a piece to think about. And we'd want them, uh, all the proposals, to be answering the key questions. Uh, and then that we would have some sort of priority given to proposals that or applications that and I've got a list of things and some of these come out right out of the uh, legislation so multi-institutional collaborative community oriented Multiple partners, uh, include multiple funding sources, interdisciplinary, collaborative with and uses the fishing fleet, um, goes after low hanging fruit. So I have some, some of those are like. Uh, adds to existing monitoring or fills in known data gaps. And has built in a peer review process.
This is your uh, it's not like all preferences. Yeah. That it, you know, as we were reviewing applications, we would give priority to proposals that come in that include one or more of those, all of those. Because it seems to me that that has to be clarified actually in the request for proposal. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, so that, you know, some projects may have a majority of those, some of them may only have a few of those, right. and then you have a, the scoring sheet that essentially gives you guidance as to where the proposal writes these criteria. Right. Yeah. Louise, I kind of missed your first one. That was, can we go back to that one real quick? You have three. Oh, just that we would solicit once or twice a year, and we would either do RFP or general grant solicitation, yeah. depending on what we were after. Do you want to talk about those now, or do you want to go through the whole list and then go back? So let's circle back. I got a couple more steps here. Right. And Proposal then we'll versus pre-proposals. Okay. I guess in the bullet there. The or second maybe just bullet. That second bullet. That should be pre-proposals or go would right to full proposals or more pre-proposals. Yeah. Would it be helpful to make it bigger font, a bigger size? Yeah, let's, yeah. let's just yeah. get them up there first and figure all that out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thank help you. Help the drawer here doesn't help. And then, uh, I'll make sure it's at the end. How about like that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'll fix the matrix hyphen insert later and spell it. And so okay, we're not watching. So, after, <laughs> so, so go to a ne the next bullet after a year. Okay. Get a blank bullet up there. And then it would be uh, RFPs or grant applications. What what does that mean? So on our RFP, we'd be, we would be asking something. for a specific set of work. And under a grant application, we would ask for proposals to answer the questions and leave it to people to figure out what it is they would submit that we'd get any answers to the questions. So in RFP, oh. we already have the question. We already have kind of what we want. And then we send it out to all of them and say, how would you propose to do this? Okay. Right. Well, my interpretation of RFP is just a little bit different than that because I think RFP, you're just asking for proposals. And then it depends on yeah. how how general or specific you well, want it to be. So if, if you're asking just for grant proposals, you still have to ask for grant proposals proposals and that would be an RFP. Yeah, so for me an RFP is asking for a discrete piece of work to be done. That's yeah. the distinction I'm making as okay. opposed to this general call for grant applications that would either engage in research or monitoring that would answer the questions. That's how I mean, like, so, so, I'm, so, what I'm, so if so if we if we had a monitoring program designed for the territorial sea we might put out an RFP to implement that specific monitoring program, as opposed to submit grant applications that all get us a, a territorial seawide monitoring program in place. Well, I've I've done RFPs that are the whole spectrum, from mm -hmm. very very specific, like your interpretation, to ones that are general and multi-topic wise. <coughs> and I think the one thing that is good about having even an RFP that's even that general is you have the criteria in there. So that people can see what, you know, whether they're doing fish or MPAs or whatever, that they, they still have some sort of sideboards of what it is we're looking for. Yeah, and what I'm suggesting is when we go to adopting rules to implement a grant program, we would allow ourselves to do any of those things, right. depending okay. on the situation. That we wouldn't restrict ourselves to one thing or the other. That's all I'm suggesting is okay. that we have both options on the table. Yeah, it just to me, it's just important that language that we use because when you're in a funders community you have a certain set mm -hmm. of language that you use that have different yeah. interpretations than yeah. not and so I just want to make sure that I understand that when you are saying RFP it's different than my understanding of RFP. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, so a couple other things um, and Chris I wouldn't title this criteria this is just all sort of the, what I would say is sort of the outline of what the rules might look like. Uh, that we would uh, uh, give ourselves the ability to use a third-party administrator. Uh, we've been talking to Sea Grant about possibly using their process uh, as opposed to creating a separate process, so giving us the ability to do that. Um, setting up some sort of uh, uh, science review 
um, before that would bring a recommendation to the trust. So, uh, some whether it's the stack that we asked to do that uh, to review them from a science perspective, and then make recommendations to us about which ones they think we should be funding that will really get at the questions we're trying to uh, get answers to. Can I do a friendly amendment to yeah. that? The idea of using the staff to convene an advisory group, so not yeah, okay. the staff yep. itself, because that may or may not have the right expertise on it, but yeah. using their expertise but to they convene would be the, the right best people. Ones to yes. Yeah. That yeah. I think so. Yeah. Uh, that the trust would make final decisions. And then there are a whole lot of other, you know, things, you know, do you want to cap the amount of money somebody could get? Do you want to limit the time period that a project needs to occur within? Uh, you know, if, if we should ever get state funding, there are, you know, biennial limitations on expenditures. And I know with OWEB they have a carryover for their capital expenditures for three biennial, I think, so they have, they can award monies for up to five years and have those completed in that six-year period of time. So there's those sorts of questions. Would you want enforceable mechanisms in the rule, or is that just something that's a... So those would generally be in the grant agreement, okay. so conditions of the the, agree, the grant agreement. Um, and we'll have to sort of figure out whether those need to be in rules or you need to have them flexible depending on what So, Louise, yep. I don't know if this is the right time to ask this question, and I'm going to sound like a broken record because it's what I brought up last time, and I brought it up even today, but um, I feel really strongly about using our positional power as the board to create a pretty defined container for projects, um, and I think I feel strongly about that because if we were to go and try to solicit private dollars or additional dollars, you know, and if I'm knocking on doors trying to do that for the trust, and I want to be able to say that we have a clear strategy, that we've given a lot of thought to this, that this is, like, if we implement this, this is the best use of our money and we can leverage X, Y, and Z dollars, however, however those money has come to us. And so I, I guess I feel I do feel pretty strongly on like a very contained experience and t contained structure, but I'm just I, I guess I want to have the conversation with the other trust members about how they're thinking about this because I don't I'm just worried that if we have a very open process with a lot of grant applications to just answer these questions, um, even with the criteria of multidisciplinary and collaborative and, you know, all these sort of bullet points that we're just going to get, we're just going to have sort of a hodgepodge of, of projects. And I don't want to be associated with a hodgepodge of projects. You know, I want, I want us to be strategic and I think forward thinking, I think we're capable of that, but I mean, it's going to take effort to create that structure and I just want to know what, where other people stand. So, Emily, can you describe a little... So, I think what you're arguing for is that we put out um, requests for proposals for discrete pieces of work and that we spend some time, given the questions that we <coughs> answers to, defining what those discrete pieces of work are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it would take a lot of... It would take our effort. Like, we would have to... I mean, it would, it would take time for us to figure out what those pieces of work are, um, but it's more aligned with the MPA monitoring work that the, o the California OST has done in terms of figuring out how what are the indicators of resiliency, or community resiliency, you know, the questions that we came up with, kind of going one level deeper internally with ourselves or potentially tasking some experts to help us um, but going one level deeper than the questions to say, okay, now we need to monitor these, you know, 10 indicators at this interval at these locations and then contract out those services, or sorry, uh, you know, do an RFP for those services. That's, that was, that, that's kind of where I was hoping this project was going, but I'd love to get 
feedback from other people, how they think about that. Well, I was thinking along much the same line during that discussion earlier, or the presentation earlier, that it seems like at some point here, we should be using at least some of our leverage to to justify the existence of those MPAs out there as, as ideal research sites to focus on any of these questions. And it doesn't have to be exclusively MPA, but I think that we ought to give some consideration to to try to utilize them when it's even approximately appropriate. And, and I think another thing, and, and it might be a little bit too focused for this, uh, is to try to focus on projects that provide a result that is not too controversial in terms of, of having several winners in this rather than having <coughs> a very specific clientele that we are funding their particular research and, and, and nothing else. I'm not saying that very well, but and it, was, it was stated earlier by uh, Skyly, I think that that to have to have some results that really show that we are a fair and impartial uh, body for this would be very helpful for us, at least out of the box here, because we're brand new, nobody knows us, and we might need to work this a little bit to make the kind of statement that we want to make as to what the trust is and what the trust is going to be doing. So, Jim, your marine protector, you're talking about Oregon's marine reserves? Yes. Okay, so I'm... Um, Does ODFW have a study plan for the marine reserves? Is that what Kristen's working on? Oh, yeah, we have, we have a whole... Um, speak have, up for them. Sure, I mean, the marine reserves program is, has um, both ecological monitoring and human dimension monitoring plans that are... Um, well formulated and are um, also, uh, dare I say, beyond the capacity of ODFW. So there's lots of room for partners in that. And then in addition, um, there are related initiatives that are described in the near shore strategy that you guys are all familiar with to some degree that, that also is focused on kind of expansion of current capacity. Yeah, so um, I... <laughs> So I'm a little concerned about focusing too much on the marine reserves uh, and losing sight of the fact that there's a whole big ocean out there in our territorial sea that is not covered by marine reserves. In fact, very little of it is. And also the fact that our marine reserves are not a system of scientifically selected marine reserves. They are discrete reserves. <coughs> Uh, without the scientific connection to really test whether they are viable in, a, in terms of uh, a set of protected areas that are going to help recover uh, fish species. Uh, that there was a lot of uh, political decision making interspersed with some science that got to those, and so I'm so I'd be a little hesitant to to do a lot of. Our work, I, I think there are places where we can help supplement the work that ODFW is doing in implementing the research design that they've come up with that sort of gets at are each of those individual reserves providing a benefit, uh, whether it's the socioeconomic benefit or the ecological benefit over the 10-year period that you're going to do that monitoring um, before they're reevaluated. So I, so I think there's opportunities for us to sort of uh, fill in some data gaps there, but I, I, I'd be hesitant to have us focus a lot of our effort around those. You know, it, it seems to me we just adopted the priority question, right? Research and monitoring. And if we're looking at our work, at least for the next five or ten years, there are certain things we would like to achieve. So working backwards, there are certain things we'd like to have in place ten years from now. So Every year as we do these RFPs, 
we will be addressing certain questions yes, or yeah. pieces of it. Yeah. You know, some of them may be specific to MPA or, or Marine Reserves, or you know, they could be to answer some of the other questions or support monitoring. And so, I think I'm like in between Emily and more general, where I feel that the RFP does need to be pretty. I keep using RFP, but the okay. call for proposals essentially does need to be as uh, more specific so that we get the types of projects that we think will help us answer at least some subset of those questions. And then hopefully the data and results from those over time will be coming into us and aggregated in a way that 10 years from now we can actually have a pattern of, of um, more information that helps with the management. So I feel that an RFP or call for proposals needs to be more specific and targeted, but that doesn't mean that everyone has to be exactly the same. You know, starting with the first one out of the shoot, I believe should be a little bit more specific. Uh, one other thing I would like to add, and I don't know if the trust wants to consider this, but in other grant programs, you actually do an RFQ first, right. where you really get your set of partners identified that you're going to be working with for the next umpteen years, and then given their qualifications, then they are the ones who will be submitting your their pool ideas, of applicants, your pool yeah. of applicants. Right. That's, you know, there is a real positive to that, but there could also be some limitations in the future unless you allow for some additional partners to be added in the future. But that's something to also consider. Yep. Yeah. Other thoughts on process, criteria? Well, I think maybe on Christina's topic, who are qualified applicants? Can an individual yeah. apply? Any individual, any entity? Um, yeah. a pro you know, like a, could a private um, Company. ecologist, you know, that I, I'm thinking of watershed councils yeah. in particular where you have people who have developed um, businesses around research and monitoring. So um, individuals, obviously academia, and you know we have agencies. Um, but what about individuals, 501c3s, um, 501c5s? Yeah, I think the way you cover that in rules is any person or entity. An entity is defined broadly in statute to cover the magnitude of Partnerships, corporations, and everything, academic information, institutions, tribes, the whole gamut. So the intent is to yeah. keep the, yeah. the applicant pool broad? Yes. That's what I would support. Yeah. Um, but, I'm sorry, could I just ask a clarifying question? Would you think of a, a consultant, so, so someone who's kind of a for-profit consultant would, would come in independently rather than <coughs> doing that through a watershed council or soil water conservation district or... Uh, some type of organization. Yeah, um, I think that's potential. Because the one thing you just have to be careful of, and I don't know the answer to this, is the IRS implications of that. Mm -hmm. uh, because I know in uh, some foundations, I mean, right now we're not an entity, we have a, a fiscal agent, but in some cases um, giving a grant to a private individual is treated differently than a grant to uh, an entity like an agency or a nonprofit organization because then it's considered more of a, a contract for services as opposed to a grant. So, but I think those are things we should probably right. explore to see what like the sideboards there are. ODA is a specialty crop grant program that receives federal money and passes right. it through, but those applicants are. They're either private cor uh, private corporations or co-ops or partner, you know, individuals or ranches or farms. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. Um, they're set up differently, to be sure. I right. didn't know if we were limiting any applicants at this stage. Oh, I think that's sort of, you know, an open question. Okay. About. Yeah, I'm sorry, you all talked about cooperative research with fishermen, so... Right. 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 What are you I thinking mean, of? doesn't NIFWA do um, grants to? Didn't they do some grants to fishing individuals for fishing with cameras on nets with right. gear selectivity? Mm -hmm. There's another example. Right. Mm -hmm. Something. 
Yeah, they can do that. Mm -hmm. Besides the marine protected areas, I think another agency that might have a need for some to fill some data gaps is going to be a DLCD with the updating of the Rocky Shores, Shores management strategy. They're just starting. That includes also offshore reefs and rocks. I'm still trying to figure out how big that definition is. And in the time that's passed, some of the problems that were identified for managing certain areas might there might be new new values you want to the state wants to consider uh, in the management of those areas. Yeah, although I think their process is probably going to be ahead of our products. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll see. But I think their intention is that it's going to be done sooner rather than later. But we'll see. Um, so other thoughts about uh, design elements of a grant program or RFP program? Well, I liked Christina's thought about it, you know, being able to iterate and change as we need to. So I wonder, um, Louise, how, how specific do we need to get today? Because what would be nice is if we're not doing a more um, structured strategic plan, then it would be nice to just have one small thing, <laughs> one test balloon that goes up, you know, that we can kind of, you know, yeah, give each other high fives when it <laughs> when it leaves and we get some awesome proposals back in and we can feel good that it was, you know, like an easy win and maybe not a large dollar amount. Um, like that's what I would recommend and then we can kind of see what we get. Um, but so I guess the question is how specific do we need to be now in defining the criteria, like is this set in stone or is this for a specific RFP? I would recommend just us drafting a very specific thing and then moving forward with seeing how it goes. So in order for us to um, award funds, uh, uh, assuming we're going to have some, we, mm -hmm. ha we have to adopt rules. So the people mm -hmm. who are applying have to know what the rules are that they have to play by. So we have mm -hmm. to go through some rulemaking to signal to applicants, here's the rules <laughs> that you're applying mm -hmm. under, and here's what you should expect to happen if you apply. Uh, so we have to go through a process to get to a set of rules for that. You can always come back and amend rules later, but it's a whole other process to do that. So I'd like to get as complete a set of rules out of the chute here on the board. You know, as I said, you can always come back and amend, but you have to restart rulemaking to amend. It's just like doing new rules from the beginning to do an amendment. It's not a quick process. And so mm -hmm. it includes setting up a rules advisory committee and getting public comment and all, all filing with the Secretary of State, and there's a whole process that at a minimum takes four months and usually takes a lot more than that at, at the end of the day. So I'd like to get as many of the elements of this program in the rules from the beginning. We may not be able to figure it all out yet, um, but I think we ought to try and get as far as we can. And I think, uh, you know, the kinds of uh, criteria in terms of the priorities would be given to, I think, are general enough, you know, that it's it's a list of things that all other things being equal, if we got a project in the door that was multi-institutional and collaborated with the fishing industry and had multiple funding sources, and we had another application to do the exact same piece of work but had none of that, we would fund the one that had those things, those elements. So that's what I'm trying yeah. to get at with those criteria. Okay. okay. Well, if, if we take a look at these, <clears throat> are there some simplifying things that we can do without changing the general thrust. For example, do we want to solicit once or twice a year? I mean, I think maybe we ought to make that decision and just have one of those. And given that we're going to be, certainly initially, probably very, very unlimited, probably once a year is going to be more than sufficient. Um, and so are we going to make those decisions today? Well, we don't have to make those today. No, I'm just because what, So what I envision coming out of here is a drafting of some rules and the 
pulling together of a, a rules advisory committee, which is the next agenda item, to actually take a look at some sort of straw man draft okay. and give us feedback on that before we ever get to the formal rulemaking process. Okay. Is, is there any reason why, at least for the first four or five years, RFPs by themselves would not serve our needs? Do we need do we need to be able to accommodate both RFPs and grants? So I, I, what I, I'm I don't think we have an, to. One, no. Another, you know, it would just simplify that both. Um, so what, what do we, we want we everybody? We solicit once a year for RFPs. Then we would request proposals once a year. Yeah. We'll put out a request for proposals once a year. And we do we want to define and just to know for later is to really define RFP. Yeah, sounds like yeah we'll have to do that in the yeah. rule process. Yep. I wanted just to remind folks. I thought I saw some heads nodding, but maybe I misinterpreted when Skyler was talking about fellowships, um, funding fellowships. So I don't know if you wanted to make space for something like that or not. Well, so I think an RFP gives you the ability to do that. So yeah. you put out a request enough. for fellowships. Mm -hmm. Yep. One other aspect up there, which uh, for technical proposals, we've, in my past life, we've always asked for peer review, you know, like a letter that just uh, provides some third party technical evaluation. Either, you know, it could be considered a letter of support or it could be uh, objective critique. So I was wondering if you wanted to consider that as part of the so you actually asked for some uh, somebody to review the proposal before it came into you well uh, the way it worked was that you'd have a proposal deadline and then we gave two additional weeks so once the proposal was done the applicant would be able to send the uh, completed proposal out for review with three different experts and then those people would uh, confidentially submit the information to to the foundation and it actually really helped a lot because we had like just a block like five questions we asked the reviewer to answer and one of them was always what's the weakest part of the proposal and I always zeroed in on that because you know they were completely confidential but they did highlight where some of the study design or something just wasn't quite um, up to snuff and these, sometimes they were perfect but these are Peer reviewers at the in the field in the field the applicant provides yeah the applicant okay. actually provides those and in some cases you know the foundation could ask for those but um, but most of the time it was the applicant and we would ask for you know an agency review or maybe some other type of entity so I was just bringing it up because it uh, for us you know when we were getting proposals on a whole bunch of different subjects we were we could recognize a really good proposal, but sometimes the methodology or something we weren't necessarily that familiar with. So having the third party review often helped us to answer the question of whether the project study design was accurate, whether they had taken everything into consideration they should have as they developed the, the proposal. So I'm just throwing that out as a... Yeah, so I don't know if under Oregon Public Records Law we could, that there's an exemption to keep something like that confidential. No. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I, that's, exactly. I guess that's the difference with the highly, private yeah, foundation. Yeah. I would highly yeah. suspect that there's not an exemption for something like that. Yeah. So that's something. And isn't that really where our stat convenes an advisory group to review as more of a public domain yes. to review? And yes, that proposals? could be. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think. So the advice. You Feel that the advisory committee would be able to take that. Yes, so that that would be the play that role exactly. Got it's it. It's sort of like the regional review team yeah. process. <coughs> you would have a staff that would do that for us. Okay. Yeah, or I could see that subset of staff that would do that for yes. us. I'm sorry, I apologize. I forgot about the yeah. They're getting away. <laughs> 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 
know who's public. Um, I don't know if you guys have these bullet points up there, but leverage is additional money or additional funding, and then um, it's not duplicative of other efforts. I think would be good criteria to include multiple, multiple funding. funding. Yeah, we have multiple funding sources up there, but not duplicative okay. or ongoing work or existing work. Good, we don't have yeah. And then I did mean, I, I think this is clear, but I just wanted to make sure, I wasn't suggesting that we focus our monitoring around the marine reserves. I was just saying that we could use um, the MPA monitoring framework as an example of how we could develop a framework yeah, uh, yeah, for yeah. Ocean, ocean Health. Okay. Yep. So would you like me to scrap the second one since we're the, that's I started on peer review because we have the independent science review down here? No, that was that peer peer review was after they did the research. Yeah, yeah no. So we have two things oh, already right. built in. So we have using stat to really review yeah. yeah. the As proposals yeah. and make recommendations. Right. That would be fine. So yeah. I think we can take that and pull yeah. it out of there. Yeah, because okay. that's the purpose that's of the good. stat process. I'm sure this will be discussed in this rules committee that you'll be convening, but um, my hunch, and I'm sure I can be convinced otherwise, would be at least for this initial first go around that having a pre proposal might be a good idea just to see the breadth of what we're dealing with and if we if we get really wrong kinds of proposals. We haven't asked people to go through a 30 page proposal Correct, process. Right. Because I second that. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. It's just a blanket process. It's so, been a so that everybody submits a pre proposal. Yeah, and it's a simpler idea. It's a simpler It's a labor saving idea. For right. Yes. It's good for, yes. the, for the applicant Until just to know. All of us get a feel for each in. other. Right. Yeah. So, okay. so I'll alter this one. I'll take the proposal. I'll just say we will. This will develop yeah, we a will. Yeah, we'll suggest we will request pre-proposals before full proposals. Yeah. I like the RFQ idea. Would that be similar? Maybe Christina, can you describe that versus full? Would that take the place of a full proposal? I'm sorry, of a um, pre-proposal. No. no. So when you're asking for an RFQ, you're asking for people's qualifications to show that they're qualified to do the. The work that we're going to mm -hmm. ask to be done under the proposals. And that would be something you do prior to ever yes. releasing a, a request right. project. And then that, <coughs> that would be a group that, it wouldn't be, so you wouldn't send it. We would it only RFQ send it to those people who are yeah. approved under the, you have a list of qualified yeah. people. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So maybe that's not appropriate. We don't want to just out. I'm just trying to reduce the workload, you know, putting in a pre proposal. If we I guess in some cases yeah, it does, yeah. yeah, it does help because you're, it's like a letter of inquiry, you know, if you're even in the ballpark or not. Yeah, yeah. if we had a big piece of discrete work that was uh, multidisciplinary and complicated, then we might want to go ask for RFQ so that we were narrowing down who we were asking to do that and we had confidence that those who were applying had the ability to do that complicated kind of research. Uh, any other, Got it, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, any other thoughts on process, criteria, Um, so this has been talking about the proposal solicitation. I'm just curious, are you also going to be discussing the project management aspects, like how often they have to submit reports or what the expectations for, you know, annual reporting? So the grant administration part of it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, there's I'm a whole other process, yeah. yeah. But we need rules for that too, right? Yes, so, uh, yeah, and they probably don't need to be uh, quite as specific as what you put in a grant agreement but we certainly need to give people some sense of what the expectations are. Are they going to have to provide twice a year reports or once a year reports? And how are we going to release money? Are we going to give them money up front? Do they bill us for expenses? How much, a, what percentage can go towards administration and indirect costs? So would that be all part of the same rule or would that be a Yes, yeah, it's all part of the same rule.
Do you want to take that up in the rule advisory committee rather right. than right. here and now? Yeah, okay. And that's the whole enough. point of a rule advisory committee. Aside from independent review, would you have a, after your, uh, your your deadline is passed for people to submit an RF or submit on the RFP, would you have a public review process or a comment period on, on what you've received at all? Or just you, you guys would no. digest internally and make a decision? No, no. <laughs> okay, so. Right. So, you know, it would go to stack for their review and then come to us for review and decision. Okay. So, um, I'm just curious if we set an RFP that has a very specific, um, I mean, we're just looking for a very specific project. <coughs> those, those details can be in the body of the description of the RFP, but don't necessarily have to be part of rulemaking. Correct. Correct, or do we have to? Okay. So the rulemaking, I'm just trying to understand what we even need what has to be in rulemaking versus what we just say we want in the proposal. <laughs> so we have to lay out the process we're gonna to use to solicit and award grants. And okay. uh, which is generally what we have to do. And that includes all of these elements that we've been talking about. But, and we would include in those rules the fact that we've got these priority research and monitoring questions and that this grant program is being designed to answer those questions so that that's mm -hmm. clear. So this is not a free-for-all in terms of mm -hmm. uh, uh, looking at what's going on out in the ocean, that there's some very specific things that we want uh, to get answers to because those are the highest priority for the state and the state waters. You can put that in the policy section. Yeah. The rule. Yeah. On this list of priorities, do we need to prioritize those priorities? I'm we, just looking at the at the first one. If we have a limited amount of money, having a multi institutional recommendation might be a little over the top for the amount of funds that. Yeah. So, so I think you know these are just a, the things that all other things being equal, if you had a multi-institutional project come in and one that wasn't, okay. we would choose the multi-institutional. Right. So think of them that way. They're sort of the tiebreakers. Gotcha. <laughs> and they're there also to encourage applicants yes, to to do that multi-institutional. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, if you have a scoring sheet, they get points for having those elements, whereas the proposals that don't have those would not get points for those elements. Which means that you could win without some of them if your proposal was big enough. Had it got more points on the other part. Sure. Yes, absolutely. There's probably very few we score high in all of those. Right. Right. Yeah. <coughs> Any other elements, criteria, things that you think we ought to tackle? So um, the next step is to dra actually draft some rules, um, which I'll work with Chris on doing. Um, you're you're going to need a... Quite good at it. <laughs> no, thank you. We're, we're putting this under Chapter 141, I assume. You'll need some division numbers. Yeah, yeah we'll have to have new division numbers from the Secretary of State's office. Okay. Um, but I, I don't think we need those yet. Nope. Um, I can draft rules without having the, the numbering system in place. Um, and start to get the, the, the key elements there. And then, um, so in terms of uh, setting up a rules advisory committee, we probably should have people who are not on the trust on the rules advisory committee. So maybe uh, a couple of uh, folks from academia, I'm, I'm thinking of the people who are gonna be using this program, some agency folks, uh, so it would be a little different. Normally you have citizen rules advisory committees. In this case, it probably doesn't make sense. Uh, you, you want a couple of 
You know, uh, we might ask Bob Bailey or Mike Graybill or Ken Bailey, who's retired from OWEB, who <coughs> ran a grant program for years. So people who have some of that expertise. And I try to keep it to five to seven folks, maybe, um, to uh, pull together, uh, have them uh, take a look at a set of draft rules, uh, give us some feedback, uh, suggestions for changes or other elements that we're not thinking about, and then bring those back to, my goal is to bring them back to the December meeting, so get the rules advisory working in fall, um, come back with uh, a recommendation from the rules advisory committee in December, and then starting the formal rulemaking process after the first of the year, with the goal that we hopefully have rules by midsummer uh, ready to go. Should we get money in the legislative session? Uh, have we, or, along that line, have we come up with a, an appropriate access? Is, it, is there going to be something that governs budget, or so, do we need the legislative to put some money in a bill? So there is a request through the Department of State yeah. Lands okay. budget for a million dollars in general fund, which it is quite unlikely will yeah. Be included in the governor's recommended budget. Yeah, that's what I was worried about. Uh, yes. No decisions have yet yeah. been made. The decisions Sorry. haven't been made, yeah. but the reality is we're facing a budget deficit, and so requests for general right. funds are really tough. And so I'm not. Ex I don't have a high level of expectation that we're going to see that million dollars in the governor's recommended budget. Okay. The ballot measure in November will influence the amount of resources, and that may change things. Right. Um, but right now, I'm. Uh, Given the current situation, I'm not expecting to see it in GRB. And the um, the minutes from the last meeting said that DSL has a pop for one million dollars general fund to help fund staff. Yeah, that's it, staff's a small element yeah. of it. Well, it's just the, all it says in the minutes is that we're asking for a million dollars to oh, fund yeah, staff. Oh yeah, no, the, so we should fix that. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> no, it's yeah. to. For a grant for well, we want 20 staff people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's, yeah. Around, but, yeah, I'm sorry. We should go back and fix that in the minutes if that's what it says. I missed that. <laughs> Just to clarify, the, the um, agencies are, are having to develop uh, right. budgets on two paths. Right, I understand. Right. So, yeah. 10% last time. Yeah. 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 Represent number of pages out. Do you want to hand it to me? DSL is already, they were an August 1 submitter, so they're, right. uh, they've already submitted the request. It's like one half staff person, right? Fund a, a grant program <laughs> and part time staff. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And also pay for expenses. Yeah. Right. Small difference. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah. Thanks sorry for to picking be so that picky. up. <laughs> yeah, no. That would not help for uh, people to read that. Do you want to readopt these? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> let's see. Who made the I uh, think I So all we need is a motion to reconsider the minutes. So move. And a second. I'll second. All those in favor of reconsidering the minutes, please say aye. 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 All right, now we need a motion no, to, to approve them as amended. As amended. And I second the amended version. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Sorry I missed that earlier. I was yeah. I was stuck on the Marion yeah. Street yeah. Bridge trying to get into town. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then was, uh, <laughs> yeah I had that Thanks. problem earlier. Uh, so that. for your re your rack, Louise, you have five to seven members. You, you, made, you referenced academia and agency folks. Did you want somebody from the applicant Which community? Well, so I think most of our applicants are going to be oh, yeah. academia, agency folks. We might want to try somebody from a private consulting firm uh, or non -pro nonprofits. But somebody yeah, from a foundation. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, uh, yeah other funders. Potential oh. funders? Other funders. Other funders. Yeah. Okay. That gives us a fairly good group. Okay. Anything else for the good of the order today? I want one question before we leave here. I'll, uh, can people do the December meeting in the morning instead of it in the afternoon? The Portland folks 
when they leave here at 4 o'clock, sit in traffic for one or more hours Feel uh, to get home. And so... I would prefer that. Okay, and so would I. So, But the question is, on the Dece- is it December 8th when we're meeting? December 8th. I'll open my calendar. I think we have December 4th. It, it might be. It was Laura. It was the day before your ODFW commission meeting. Right? Yeah. So that's the first. Okay. So in the morning on December first, can everybody make it? Sure. From we'll make it from nine to noon. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah, that works. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Have that worked for that. you, Emily, in the whole, in the commute. Yeah, she requested this. Yeah, it's yeah, I request, it's way better. I I just barely. I think I got home at like eight o'clock the other day. It's just mm-hmm. so long to sit there. Yeah. In Portland traffic. Yes. But don't start too early because then you'll have the Portland morning commute to to get through. It's fine once you get. Oh, that's true, man. I guess I just stuck the other way. I know. It's, it's fine. You know, it's fine that once you get south of, of Portland, it's very very smooth. So. Yeah, I think it's better morning. Just look it up. Yeah. I guess you're right. It's, yeah, I didn't think about it that way. I don't think I caught traffic going in the morning. No, it's a Thursday. It's a Thursday. It's a Thursday. Okay, so everybody, nine to noon on the first. We will look for a venue. Looks good. We're looking for a venue? Oh, we will. There's no venue available? We're no, I don't know. Here? Yeah, okay. Well, oh, is it, not it will likely be here if we can. Yeah. If we can it's, a it's a Thursday, so it's a Luma oh, day so here. So we can't use this room. So oh, okay. one of it's our tenants is uh, Lady's Board of Appeals. So, so 201 or down at DLCD or out at OSW. Yeah. 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 Then you can talk to worry about parking. Yeah, okay. Whatever works. It's it just ODFW makes the Portland folks drive a little further down, but but it's right off it's right off the freeway, so it's free parking. It's, it's yeah, sort of right off the freeway. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's true. Right. <laughs> if they get to keep the building, right? If they get to keep the building. <laughs> if they get to keep the building. <laughs> okay, I think we're done for the day. Adjourned. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Hope your kids are safe, Emily. <laughs> Safe? Well, she said she had to call in because she was. There were some issues. She has hikers on. Oh, oh, not her own children. Not her own children. Yes, but she sends teens into the outdoors. Yeah. David's working with Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
She also worked at OWEB. So. She also worked at OWEB. Yeah. And OEC. Well, that's a good name. Could be a good name. So I'm going to see her next week. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll let you. You want me to say something to her? Yeah, sure. See if she has any interest in it. Having a staff person that cares about us is really important. Right. It has a lot of influence over the board. Yes. Thanks, Louise. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And now I just was just hang up this phone, huh? Talk to some people were saying. Oops, uh, I muted it. Away. I didn't hang it up. It just kind of. Right. It, 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 it looks like the blog got. Or they thought El Nino was going to take it out. And they said it looked like it was, but it was mostly just strong winds cooling down the surface. But still but underneath, it, it did. As soon as the El Nino started, it came apart. It started like shivering. So made made it very well. Yep. This one's.